Let me ask you a question. Yeah. If you could do anything in the world right now, what would it be? Like absolutely anything. Absolutely anything. I'd have a saxophone that I couldn't play, so I could do exactly what I'm doing, but really. That's right. No! It's Brian's old school anime reviews, oh. and today Brian is going to be reviewing Akira. <laughs> Katsura Hotomo. A genius, but also a man. Akira was printed on Japanese phone books, 2,000 phone books to be exact, between the 1960s and the 1980s. That's right. And then in the late 80s, they decided that they would animate these phone books into a motion picture called Akira. Uh, It tells the story of a young boy named Tetsuo and his best buddy Canada as they face the open roads of Neo Tokyo. And along the way, a big blob of a boy befriends them. And there's the evil Colonel. But you know, it's kind of a metaphorical thing. Because it could be about the struggling economy. It could be about what science shouldn't dare touch. Or it could just be about two guys and a boy with a blob for a face. Uh, we're gonna take it over to the vibrating scale. Brian, what vibe does this get? Right now I'm vibing an 8.2 out of a possible 5.7. Nice. That was really good. That was really, really good. I wish I could take the look of horror on Neve's face when I started playing the music (laughs) and bottle it and just drink it. She looked like Kermit getting hit by Miss Piggy. Yeah, just... just (sighs) Like, just abject universal horror, and it was... oh. You haven't sprung that on me in so long, I was not expecting it at all. So, Neve, when I... I feel like I understand your, like, sphere of attention across time. This is something I've learned over the many, many episodes we've done this. (laughs) And so I know when something is no longer within your, like, zone. Yeah, no, that that was gone... I, I could have totally forgotten it ever existed if it just had gone a little longer. Yeah, you never maybe never would have thought of it yeah, again. Yeah, never. I honestly thought the last episode you were going to do one of these and I had, like, mentally prepared. But the thing is, I'll never know which anime it's going to be, mm-hmm. but I have, like, a rough structure in my head. Yep, yep. It's one of my favorite things we do on this podcast. You do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty, like, agreeable to it. Yeah. I like it. Brian doesn't know what's happening either. No. For the longest time, I thought he did, and I thought it was both of you pulling a horrible prank on me. No, no, no it's me pulling a horrible prank on both of you. No. Like, kind of stabbing you both and getting you back for everything. Like there that shit are... before the podcast this time. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that John and I do that you don't know about, like... I don't even know how to explain what I just saw. Why don't you try? Um, So, oh, fuck. Uh, Imagine Charlie's angels. (laughs) And they're making finger guns with both their hands together. But just before they shoot, they slide out one of the guns and only shoot with a single hand. She doesn't get it. It's kind of like a, a, you know, like a gotcha. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's it's a cool thing. But it's kind of sultry. Like, there's that real slow rise from above your head. Like, that's why I said Charlie's Angels. It's there's real something cool. sexy about it. It's real cool to do that in, in, a, in, in, in a hotel room or at airport security. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to see who could do it the best just before you get to the scanner. Yeah. Shouldn't have done it to those security guys. <laughs> I'd not appreciate that. No. No. Welcome to the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast. The world's strongest video game podcast. I am sitting here with two beings sculpted entirely from retrograde plastic. 
I just fucking kept going with that sentence word by word. I didn't know where we were headed, but I guess we got there. To my right, encased entirely in a solid plastic film like an action figure that we will one day sell and make so much money off. It's Neve. Hi. And to my left, occupying the bargain bins of many Toys R Us's, it's the unsuccessful toy. It's Brian. I exist in many forms and I am a multi-use form of plastic. With you always, I am your host. Will Smith. <laughs> it's the Willennium. I watched a video today about why Aunt Viv got fired. <laughs> who? And so, who, yeah, oh yeah. Who? Yeah. Who? Aunt Viv from Fresh Prince. They switched oh. the actress between oh. seasons three and four. Oh, okay. Because do you not do you not watch on Fresh? I haven't watched much Fresh uh, Fresh Prince. Oh, it's so it's, it's really... so good up to up to like the end of season three. Yeah, and then it's like it has one of the most monumental like shark jumps ever in between seasons. It's so fucking weird, and I'd love to make a video about it, but I don't know if I'm the person who should be talking about the relevance of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. No. <laughs> no, sir, so. you are not. No, no, I am not. But, um... Brian. Yeah? We got a big one. Yeah? I would say the media event of the year. Oh, yeah? The Sonic the Hedgehog movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I saw the Sonic the Hedgehog movie, everybody. And it is fine. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it's a 6 out of 10 movie. Uh, it's got some cute moments and there's stuff in it that doesn't work. And there, there's some stuff in it that does work. And I enjoyed it overall. Is that your fucking review? Yeah, is that's that it? so shitty. <laughs> Brian, that's like, a, that's like a review of any movie ever. Honestly, it's one <laughs> of the... We gotta get it existed. We it gotta, was there. I saw it. it. I, I did watch it. Now, I did watch it. I, Brian... I did. Brian, okay. I absolutely did I, I don't, don't want to start it. this podcast off on a down note, but if you don't fucking shape up and stop okay. drinking that goddamn tea... Okay, I'm drinking my CBD tea. I'm having a great time. All right. How about I say some things I liked and some things I didn't like about the Sonic the Hedgehog oh, it's a, movie? Yeah. It's a revolutionary concept. <laughs> okay. I think as a Jim Carrey comedy vehicle, it is a very good Jim Carrey movie. Uh, there and, you go. Now, that's the Brian we know and love. And is it specifically a Jim Carrey movie? Uh, it's one of his best. Okay. Uh, it is evoking 90s Jim Carrey, who I long thought had died, um, <laughs> but... Like, in a nearly literal sense. Yeah, because, yeah. like, Jim Carrey is not doing real well. Now, I did like that TV show he was in last year, and I was a huge Jim Carrey fan as a kid. Kind of fell out with him, fell out of Jim Carrey fandom in the 2000s, just like Jim Carrey himself did. But apparently Jim Carrey's daughter is a big Sonic the Hedgehog fan, so he took this role very seriously. And honestly, like... Jim Carrey in this movie reminds me of Raul Julia in the Street Fighter movie. I was just going to say that because he took yeah, that role because he took because of his kids. kids. Like, he's giving 110%. He is not reading the script at all. He's just ad-libbing whatever the fuck he wants. And he is just high energy, doing weird things with his body and mouth throughout that film. I really like when actors take roles for their kids. Like Mad Mickelson taking the Rihanna video. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, I don't know who that is. And his kids yelled at him for a really long time. Yeah, that would do it, I'd say. Mm. Um, no, I, I just really liked Jim Carrey growing up. And it was great to see him, like, back on form. Yeah, on form doing his thing. Have you guys seen any of the interviews he's been doing? Yeah. I, I saw the one where he did the Grinch face. And, oh, yeah. What the hell? And I've seen the Ben Schwartz Polygon interview where he just, like, breaks the whole thing down. Very good. Yeah. I, I've, I've, I've seen him, like, be re Like, there's one. He did one with Conan. And it was like, it was actually cool. It like, it was like, oh, Jim Carrey. But then it's, you know, there's where he's kind of a jerk. And it's like, oh, Jim Carrey. He's real weird on the red carpet. Yeah, I, like, I hate how he treats people in those yeah. situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's good to hear that he's like doing good shit again. He's very funny in this movie. And there's some weird lines of dialogue that he says. And I'm like, that shouldn't be in a... How is the hedgehog? Song is grand. He's goodness. Um, he's voiced by Ben Schwartz, who we all know professionally as Randy Cunningham from our experience of working on the television mm -hmm. show Randy Cunningham. And he's playing Sonic like a sixteen-year-old. We met him. Yeah, we did. Yeah, lovely guy. Yeah. Um, but like, it's his voice, but like a bit higher pitched, and it's high energy. 
just like he was on Randy. And I was kind of worried I was going to be thinking about Randy Cunningham the entire time, but it didn't pop into my head at all. That's good. Uh, and he does a pretty decent Sonic. Um, I wasn't super into Sonic. Like, I, I, like for me, it was all about Dr. Robotnik in the movie. Okay. It's a very good Robotnik movie. But then, like, okay, some stuff I didn't like about it. It's very unoriginal in places in that the film starts off and it's got one of those... You're probably wondering how I got in this situation. Mm. Now, it doesn't have the record scratch, but it does have a thing where it's got the rewind sound effect and it, like, plays back to the oh, beginning. Oh, okay. Like, we're at the point where that's... Like, I'm, I'm sure they knew what they were doing with, like, the fucking meme shit. Yeah. But, eh. And there's a big kind of, like, one of the big set pieces and, like, it looks great, but it is one of those things where... You see Sonic at full speed, but it's from his perspective, and it's the thing where it's done in like over the hedge and in all the X Men movies with Quicksilver. Oh, so he's moving through everything while everything's static. Yeah, or in super slow motion. Okay, and he's like moving around and like readjusting and playing pranks on people. I don't think anything will ever beat the Quicksilver version of that. Yeah, like the the they're, they're fucking solid. Um. It, it, it is a good scene and it's well lit and stuff actually the, the film is well directed it's very easy to follow the action of this movie and it seems like they had a lot of footage with a lot of improvised dialogue but they picked the best lines like it, it, it is a well made movie and the color and lighting is very good it's very easy to see the blue character run from the red character so Knuckles is in this movie no Robotnik is in this movie um how's <laughs> how's Cyclops James Marsden is better than I thought he'd be. I'm not a fan of James Marsden. But Which one of you just touched my leg? That was me. I apologize. Don't apologize. That's that's that's, that's just something that has to happen. I, I, I just got excited thinking about James Marsden. So Neve is like the only person who likes James Marsden. He, <laughs> like he's a very good straight man. He's very good as a foil to a more interesting character. Yeah, he's like a face. Who's yeah beautiful and also just like the perfect casting for Cyclops he is. I bet He's if he'd never played Cyclops you would hate him just like, like you do in, all men Neve. I like him in Enchanted as well. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, he's fantastic in Enchanted. I think the reason why he was cast in this movie is because James Marsden has acted alongside CGI animals several times before. I love that that's yeah. a skill. You know, like, he, he is genuinely good at talking at eyeline to a character that is not there. Who's like the best at th- Oh, Bob, Bob Hoskins was amazing at it in Roger Rabbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was totally. a pro. Except in that one poster. Yes. Shocking. Um, um, he does a very good job at kind of being the serious guy around Sonic and the very serious guy around Dr. Robotnik because there is some dialogue exchange between those two adult men, which is just fucking weird. Are, are we talking good weird? Brian weird. Okay. Oh. Like the kind of stuff I'm into, but that's not good. Like if I went to fanfiction.net and I typed in, in these characters' names. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, a bit. Okay. Um, also, Sonic is kind of horny for James Marsden's character, Tom. Like, he knows Tom real well because he's been, like, stalking him for about 10 years. 10 what? years? Because he lives in Green Hill, Montana, and it's uh, he, he, he fled Mobius via a portal and has been hiding. From for the, 10 years? Yeah, since the age of 6 to about 16. Oh. It, 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 That's a really weird detail. <laughs> it, it, it's got like a very weird lore dump at, yeah. the, at, at the at the beginning and at the end, and it kind of sets up a sequel. And I actually do hope this film gets a sequel because I'm really excited what they what they do with the the Sonic. Is universe. there a post credit sting? Oh yeah, you got to have one of those now. Okay, is it? You hear like you hear gunshots, and then you hear "Let's go, motherfuckers!" and Shadow the Hedgehog on screen for like a second. Uh, not yet, but I, I, I'd say if we do... We're heading to- there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Um, and the film cost $55 million to make. It cost $50 million, and then it cost another $5 million to do that big retake to fix Sonic's face. Jesus! <laughs> and it made $100 million back over the weekend, so... Okay. It's, it's safe out. It's one of the most successful video game movies. Is... I, I saw a big, like, Rossetti or thread people saying whether this would gross more or Detective Pikachu would gross more. It's gross, like... F- three or four million more than Detective Pikachu. That's insane. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. I never... Uh, I know, right? I, I would have I bet, like, anything that Detective Pikachu yeah. would gross more. I was pleasantly surprised by this film. Um, it it's, sounds it's like not, the best case scenario. Yeah. Uh, there, there was one other thing I read in, like, about the film is that there's loads of product placement in it. They mentioned the Olive Garden several times. Towards the end, it's a joke, but it's still kind of, like, 
They're still doing it. They're still doing it. There, there, there's also a uh, American version of a house finding website similar to daft.ie that we use here. I think it's called Zazzle or something. or is, it, it, it starts with a Z. But they mention it by name and show like a very obvious image of it on screen on a laptop. Weird. That's so weird. Like, how does that even happen? Like, how do you hook up Sonic the Hedgehog movie with a rental service? Yeah, and it's it's not and like, it, like it, it would make sense if there was like some fast food chain that does like chili dogs like Sonic. for that to be in it. Yeah, or Sonic the fast food chain. Um, I think it's really like and like this film is super successful. I think it's really lame that Sega don't have the Sonic game out right now. They would probably or even plans for one or even plans like they should probably make a Sonic game again. Yeah, mm-hmm. I guess they should. Um, but no, like I, I like this movie. There's some w- weird jokes that I'd like to talk about, but I probably won't uh, just yet. Maybe in the few months time I will. But fuck's sake, there's some weird shit in that film. Um, I'm but- really excited to see this like unrequited sexual tension. Yeah. Um, Dr. Robotnik also has a like secret agent kind of like lackey that he's kind of like that that he treats like a punching bag but their relationship is really fucking funny it's not a healthy relationship but it's one that is like a, a funny ship uh, guys I've been trying to hold off talking about Riverdale until the season's over but my fucking god this season is some of the craziest shit ever it's top in season 3 mmm you see, season three bordered on supernatural. Yeah, because I'm watching Rebecca watching season three now, and I saw flying babies. <laughs> what is Riverdale Drakengard? What the hell? Uh, it's kind, it's kind of it's, <laughs> okay. Like, oh, has the Gargle King come into it? Uh, I missed that episode, but I was described. Oh, he'll be, he'll be back. It, it was like a bunch of like it was like a, a really tall puppet. Yep. With. There might be human puppeteering it, but it was like eight feet tall and yeah. made out of sticks with like a crown, like a feathery kind of like bird like thing. Like, mm-hmm. I guess a gargoyle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been so fucking weird. And it just made me think of a, what you were saying about like Sonic and this guy, because there's this really intense relationship between a father and daughter in Riverdale. But they've kind of started like, I know it's not intentional, but I think they've started unintentionally making it a really like weirdly sexually tense relationship ah. and it's fucking the strangest thing in the world like me and Michelle are watching it and we look at each other and we're like what the fuck are they doing oh dear yeah it's 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 because they get 13 year old a uh, 30 year olds to pay 16 year olds that that is true though mm-hmm. like you were it's but then but then but then the like parent actors are in their early 40s yep. so there's yep. not that much of an and, like, age with Riverdale as well it's like every seven episodes they'll be in high school you know it's like you don't and these are high schoolers that like own gyms and have their own book series and run speakeasy bars and it's it's the dumbest shit and I still love it feel like they've mismanaged certain plots this this uh, this season. I think they started off with a goal in mind. They did at the end of season 3 is a flash forward to a point in season 4. We've now hit that point and how we got there was silly, but not like smooth silly like the rest of Riverdale. It was kind of just a bit stupid. It didn't stick the landing well. It's more like <laughs> 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 it's okay. more like the landing already happens, but like the the arc of the jump to get there made no fucking sense at all. Like there's right angles in it. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but um, Riverdale's still stupid and pretty great. Um, <laughs> Neve. Yes. I think this is maybe the most Neve sounding title of anything I've ever heard. But let's talk about Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Oh, you saw it. Brilliant. Yes. um, I saw this on Valentine's Day. Like Brian saw Sonic. Yeah. We both did what we needed to do on Valentine's Day. So I went to a Valentine's Day screening of Portrait of a Lady on Fire. And it was sold out and full to the brim with lesbian couples. It was fantastic. There was two straight couples there. And I think they were like didn't expect there to be so many lesbians but there were um (laughs) it it was um it was a really uh it was a time uh this is a french lesbian movie and it is about a painter who is commissioned to paint a wedding portrait of an aristocratic woman 
So she arrives on an island to paint this woman. She hasn't seen her yet. She doesn't know much about her, but she's told that the last person, the last painter who arrived to the island to paint her was fired and sent away. So the painter has to go undercover as her kind of maiden, her kind of just beach friend to walk with and study her and paint her in secret because before you get married you need a wedding portrait and Eloise the woman does not want to be married she used to be a nun but her family brought her back home to get her specifically married because she is now the oldest daughter of marrying age after her sister's death so there's this really romantic notion of this undercover painter having to steal glances at this at this other woman on a beach like like study her face or study her ear or study the way she holds her hands or the way her hair falls so she can go home and in the evening by candlelight try and sketch it out and it's this real slow burn relationship between these two women Eloise never knows that Marianne is painting her and Marianne finally finished the portrait and she realizes her time would be done with her but she also you know feels bad for lying and she has to come clean about it and f- their relationship progresses and it is basically a slow motion painting of a romantic few days between these women women it's an extremely small cast i think it's like four or five characters there's one other character in it called sophie who I really like. Uh, they have to take care of her. She's like the kind of ma- uh, maid of the house. And they kind of have a, like, they just have fun together and they have little, like, they have to help her out in some kind of horrible and sad ways as well. But uh, it's it's just this relationship between these two women and this other other woman and just, just a real slow burn French lesbian movie like it's hard to say anything because it's literally just them being intimate with each other for a while and it is the most French form of intimacy <laughs> oh, bonjour. What, what does that mean <laughs> Ooh, la, la. Uh, what do you think is the most French way you could use snuff like you know the snuff box like tobacco or maybe it's weed or hash I don't know like what is the f- most French thing you could do with that go on well, it's not smoking it, but it might be shoving it in an armpit. What? Is it a hairy what? armpit? Yes, it is. It's French. Yeah. <laughs> hairy armpits are great. Très bien. But it's like, uh, it's just like, you know, the French sex. Is that sex- a legitimate way to like... No, it is absolutely not. Oh, it's, it's a French way. <laughs> it's, it's, what the fuck are they doing? Are you French? Do you do stuff with your armpits? Have you not seen like a lot of French movies? Sexuality and like. Well, no. Sometimes it's I so... see stuff where people are into things that I don't understand at all, <laughs> and that sounds like something like that. Yeah, no, but it was for that moment as well. Like I, she holds I don't, up I, the. I want to go into further detail, but I feel like we're gonna <laughs> wander into some. <laughs> She holds up the snuff box and she's like, oh, what could we do with this? And in my head, I'm like, smoke it. And then she just like, right in there into an armpit. I, I don't understand. Yeah, it's French. You don't have to. Was, 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 was there like mild laughter during that? No, bit? no. Everyone's there was lesbians fucking... weeping. Like <laughs> next to Rebecca, there was a girl just fucking dying. Like it was a young lesbian who was just like crying at the beauty of the film. Next to me, there was an elderly lesbian couple. I'd say they were in their 60s. And, and one of them at one stage was like, do you have any more nuts? And the other one was shaking out nuts. Oh, and yeah. that's so cool. So it ran the gamut of age groups, like of like lesbians around. And some were just having religious experiences and and somewhere just like oh we're out for a nice evening and uh i i really enjoyed the movie but i also wasn't like absolutely in love with it it's not my favorite lesbian movie of all time but What's i was your favorite lesbian movie Eve? uh the handmaiden yeah hell know. fucking yeah that's a great ass movie yeah uh, it's an ad- it's an adaptation of a book i really like called the fingersmith from sarah uh, by sarah water and i read that as a teenager and that's been adapted into uh, an English movie and then adapted into a, a Korean story and I just love how that story could keep going and keep being this uh, beautiful lesbian love story it could be a video game if it wants oh be. god yeah oh man <laughs> <laughs> oh game of the year that year um, oh, yeah. does this film fall into any, any like weird tropes or no know, it, 
Uh, it's okay. Uh, well, no, no one dies. Okay, but it, it's. I, I would hope we're getting to the point where that's like a known stupid trope, and it's not just bad; it's uncreative and boring. You would think so. I mean, the sad thing about this is like it's set in 1770. There's no way these women can be together, and there isn't a happy ending. But there is a beautiful moment where they do get to be together, and like that. That's all they could really have because what it means to be a woman in that time and what her position was is to be married off because that's 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 it that's what you got um so it was it was a nice way to spend valentine's with a a, win a big room with a lot of other gays uh (laughs) i I like the movie dream came true i also really like that there's a french lesbian movie on the other spectrum from blue is the warmest color so blue is the warmest color probably arguably the worst lesbian movie and portrait of a lady (laughs) on fire is is not the first time (laughs) eve has like swerved to shit on blue is the warmest color (laughs) it's the fucking worst movie ever but i like that there is a lesbian movie made by like uh like by people who who care also if you like just like watch like 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 watching people draw or paint uh they have the artist in it her name is elaine delmer it's her hands that are drawing all the pieces of art in it and oh, cool it's nice to see her sketch and she's just a beautiful uh, amazing artist um so yeah it's like it's a, like a two-hour painting um and if that sounds interesting you should go see it neve sounds great can i tell you a valentine's day fact go for it okay cool because I wanted to tell you this, because uh, it's just it's Ireland and Valentine's. I know we're a little late, so the the saint Saint Valentine, his remains are in Dublin. Wow! So I used to live next to a church. I lived in a pokey little apartment next to Whitefriar Church up on just above Anger Street in Dublin City. So you keep going up Georgia Street, and you'll see it. And there is a um casket that is said to hold the remains of saint valentine and the remains were given to an irish priest by pope uh i think it was george gregory the 16th given to an irish priest because he thought the irish priest was pretty funny so he just gave this italian man's like part of his body to <laughs> this dude's a riot <laughs> this so irish get him priest. a body doesn't matter which one <laughs> So uh, I didn't know you could do that with someone's remains, but sure. If you're a pope, I guess you can. Fucked up thing is people just know he's in there waiting, but no one knows for what. <laughs> if every Irish person was given a body for being chatty, we'd all have a lot of bodies just around us. Yeah. But on Valentine's Day, there's a lot of uh, religious weirdos that wait outside the church to go pray at the St. Valentine's. They're like, today's going to be the day. Yeah. He's going to get up and start wrecking shit. No more love. It's and over. No more saint love. Valentine is also the patron saint of epilepsy. Oh, sweet. Oh, yeah, that is a kid. This has definitely been one of the more Neve segments of this show. I'm glad. Brian. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about the What We Do in the Shadows TV show. Oh, yeah. Um, I spoke about this a, w- a few weeks ago that I was going to watch this TV show, didn't I? Yeah. You said, I'm going to watch that show. I watched it. It's very good. Um, so everyone who calls Brian a liar, fuck you. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to prove it? I just proved it. God, not on me, bitch. I watched What We Do in the Shadows, the Walk television away. show. Walk the fuck away. Yeah, uh, now on FX, as they say on the file that I watched. <laughs> <laughs> because there's no... Like, I, I, I had to torrent these show, the show because there's no other way to watch it. Sorry, grandma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very good. Um, I was a bit kind of apprehensive. The first three episodes, and I think... This is kind of a thing with a lot of adaptation reality TV shows. I kind of got this from The Office as well. I'm a Parks and Rec. First couple episodes are kind of rough. I find that and just with like sitcoms and comedy in general, they yeah. always need a couple episodes. You gotta yeah. know like the season. cast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so the first couple episodes, they are retreading ground of the film. There's even an episode where they are fighting the werewolves. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but then you get you, you uh, kind of figure out the characters, and like it does have the same dynamic where you have three vampires three and a half and then they have an older vampire who is not in the basement but instead in the attic of the house like it, it, it's very similar one of the vampires is a woman and her and so this is a different group of vampires it's a different group of vampires in staten island but it exists in the same universe of the film right okay because in one of the episodes the new zealand vampires make an appearance because there is a gathering of the vampires so you get to see lots of different vampires does 
Taika show up in that? Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, so, I, sorry, Brian. No, I, watched, uh, I watched an interview with Taika on. with Titi. Mm-hmm. He's really handsome. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. No, he's he's really handsome. And he wears very gray. nice shirts. He's got gray hair, but he rocks it so oh, well. So well. It, he's got this really, really nice style to it. I was kind of annoyed because it's just like, no, oh, you're just kind of fucking perfect, aren't you? Yeah, he's 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 a full package. Mm. Um, there's some later episodes then where one of them turns into a bat and then gets taken away by animal control, and the episode is about <laughs> rescuing him from animal control. <laughs> but they have to get permission to be invited in. And so <laughs> no. the guy behind the counter is like, yeah, come on in. And they're like, finally, and they can get in. And then like, but vampires can turn themselves into dogs as well. So they're trying to go up with different ways to rescue each other. But the vampire Laszlo, who's played by Matt Berry, he's in with all the animals and he's going, okay, so we're going to rally together to escape. And you just hear, wow. <laughs> and it's just, it's just really funny. They have this new kind of vampire in it uh, called Colin Robinson, and he's an energy vampire. And he's just this, like, the most vanilla-looking white dude who's an office worker. And his <laughs> thing is, he's incredibly boring, and he saps your energy. Oh. And there's a bit later on in one of the episodes where he takes a DNA test, and it's like, it says I'm 100% white. There's nothing else there. Like, he's exactly <laughs> like, he's just... Uh, but he's played by the guy who was in Better Call Saul Season 1, who had his baseball card stolen. Oh, that guy's great! Yeah, he's so perfect, and like, he, and like, I think he's like the strongest vampire because he can like defeat all the other ones if they have a fight, and he's really fucking weird, and he's such a great addition to the show. Like, you know that show that wasn't the Adams Family, the monsters. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, you know how they had a Frankenstein dad and he had like a vampire looking mom and a werewolf son. Yeah, but then the daughter was like, she looked like a, a human civilian. Yeah, and you were like, what the fuck is up with her? Like, it's 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 the same kind of thing. That's I, cool. I, I really really like that idea that. They, 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 they hide in plain sight because all the other vampires look like they're in big fucking capes wearing like ruffles and stuff. Mm. Um, then they have the older vampire who is played by Doug Jones, who's a really, really good um, like makeup actor. And he, he, he was the, 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 the oh, creature in, in Discovery, Star Trek. He's in Star Trek Discovery yeah. and he's in The Shape of Water as well. Oh, he's big, very good. Big, long, skinny guy, mm. but he's very good in makeup. But he plays like a... Like, I don't know. I like, I think it's like a thousand year old vampire who doesn't have any genitals anymore, but that makes it even sexier. And there's an episode where they go out partying in New York with him, and it's just a vampire, like a really old vampire getting drunk in a nightclub, and it's really funny. <laughs> that sounds great. And there's a bit where he eats pizza, and vampires can't eat food, so they just start puking it off right away. <laughs> and it's got some good CGI, but I do think it's like Arrested Development where they hide a lot of trickery with handheld camera work mm. so it looks like there's multiple actors all in the one scene but they were actually shot separately and like stitched together yeah because the gathering the vampires feels like the new zealand actors weren't actually on set oh that's kind of oh yeah but then Jermaine clement who was the other director on what we do in the shadows directs a lot of the episodes and taika wrote a lot of the episodes so i, I do think they're involved i just don't think i, I just think they're too busy as well yeah mm. yeah that makes sense but yeah, good show. That sounds great. I'm going to cool. check that out. Same. So, Valentine's Day. Brian? Yeah. You saw Sonic the Hedgehog? Neve? You saw the lesbian movie? I did. I saw Parasite. Uh, yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> yep. Um, I really didn't know what to expect in this going in because, like, there's a lot of buzz around it, but I also yeah, find, yeah, like... Yeah, there is now. No one really... It, it's a tough it's a weird film to describe in a lot of ways I found it very hard to explain it a few months back yeah. like, even though I was excited I didn't want to say anything it about. surprisingly has stayed very spoiler free yeah yeah. until now okay I'm going to try and explain like the basic premise of this movie uh, maybe if you want to avoid that although fuck it whatever no, look, it's won four Oscars yeah. this movie's won four Oscars and it came out nine months ago yeah like we got it last yeah like fuck it like it, it, everyone who's wanted to see this film has seen it uh, so basically it's this Korean movie where um, there's this family and they're kind of just bad at life things are not going well for them they yeah. don't have a lot of money they have this like they work as like pizza box folders in their home and the pizza company comes and like collects the pizza boxes from them and there's a really beautiful little moment in the like first five minutes to kind of show you the dynamic of the family where the there's four of them and the the girl collecting the pizzas is like uh 
one in four of these boxes is folded completely incorrectly and they all just look at the dad and he's just like <laughs> and I thought that was such a cute way to kind of set up like this family's relationship um, and as things kind of transpire the son of the family gets a job tutoring the daughter of a rich family and from there he seeks to first get his sister a job as like the art tutor for their son and then slowly replace the other servants of the family with his family so that his dad becomes the driver his mom becomes the maid and it's a really that whole sequence and dynamic is so fascinating as you're watching this one family like latch on to this other family like a like a leech mm. yeah um they should have called the movie Leech. <laughs> the Leech family. <laughs> yeah, but um, it, and I really loved that. Um, as the movie goes on, things kind of. I'm not going to spoil this part, but they add another layer on top of it, and it's actually here where I think I kind of it didn't lose me, but I loved the first third of it so much, and from there things got much zanier. And kind of by the end of the movie, I ended up not really enjoying it as much as I kind of started out. And I liked it. Like, it was it was, it was, was a good movie, but I don't think I'd, like, be in love with it either. Like, I haven't really thought about it since I saw it. What? That's insane. I saw it recently as well, and I have spent every single day since seeing it thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking about it for the last six months. Yeah. Yeah, I just... Brian, I have a question for you as well, because you watched this ages ago, and what it was it? a really bad fan sub, and you kept saying there was someone Midnight called Father. Midnight Mid- Father. Yeah, what was that? Who was Midnight Father? It's one of the last lines of the films, and it's like, Daddy comes out at midnight to go to the fridge. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I thought, like, I-, I did really enjoy it, but, like, towards the end, it just kind of felt like a wacky caper to me. Yeah, like it's, yeah. it's a South Korean film. Sure. Well, like that's not all South Korean films. I think it is. I love that it was a caper. It was like a like a horrible murder caper, but it was a caper. Yeah, but for me, like I was just more into. <coughs> I was more into like the first part of it, where it's like this is so fucking weird. I, I do wish it stuck around more in that because mm. as soon as that gets established, it immediately get the rug pulls off yeah. from yeah. that. And I wish they did hang around with it because there's like maybe like a day later that that falls apart. But the pacing of that film is like is is good. I would agree. Like I really like that bit as well, where they're just kind of subsuming all these places and like they have that danger of being kind of caught a little bit. Um, but the pacing of this is so rock solid. Like it just, I never felt bored. It was consistently oh, no, not, going and, like, that's and something thing I happening. I really liked about it as well. I didn't feel like there was like uh, there wasn't like any flab on this movie. It's yeah. like everything was taught and even like little throwaway pieces of dialogue like someone being allergic to something mm-hmm. then become much more relevant and it's like tiny little details all kind of they all added to the film and like it was really fun. Like it's beautifully shot and the location was the like house the was house really soldiers. really cool. The top of it's all CG. Whoa. Cool. <laughs> No, I, I I love that third act. I love the the stress of it, mm-hmm. and just I, I how it, it keeps was fine. stacking. I think I've just seen other stuff that I like better that has that same kind of tension. It gets compared to Get Out a lot because it it, it's, it explores a lot of the same themes. Um, but I I I was just so into it, and it was good to watch with proper subtitles because like it like the film is very easy to follow visually, but there's some great dialogue subtleties. I like when characters are trying to manipulate each other. They're using, like, they're calling each other sis and bro mm-hmm. as a way to, like, try to be on the same social level as each other. Mm. But they're clearly not because they're from completely different lives. Yeah. There's some really great performances in it as well. Yeah. And um, the- I loved the sister of the poor family. She's, she's amazing. Great. So good. And, she, and, and she's, probably, she's probably the smartest person in the film. Yeah, the way she yeah. kind of took her role and manipulated the family was so believable just because of like the cadence in her voice when yep. she like 
gave commands, you know. Yeah, I really and she could yeah. command them. Once she came in, she commanded straight away. 100%. Yeah. She was like, her kind of thing was that they'd get her in as an art tutor, but she became an art therapist extremely quickly because yeah. she knew she could manipulate the mother of the rich family because we, we, we've been told she was uh, a little simple. We She could manipulate her into thinking that her son needed art therapy. Yeah, I really like the rich mother as well because like, she is simple, but you you uh, kind of get to learn her thoughts towards the end of yeah, the movie. Yeah, it's, it's not like she's a dumbass. It's no. like she's just has a particular way about her. Yeah. I also think she's trying to keep the house running for her husband. So, yeah. so she's also really stressed and worried about things not being pristine yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah uh, and like, so her attention couldn't go other places. Yeah. So she couldn't notice this fucking family creeping mm-hmm. into her yeah. life. I really, she- li- I really like the poor dad as well. That's what's his name? Song Kang. He has some voice. Yeah, he's 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 in like he's probably like the second most famous South Korean actor, um, because he's in loads of Bong's films. He's in them all, nearly, isn't he? he? I yeah. think he's like his muse. Basically, he's, he's in Memories of Murder. He's in uh, he's in Snowpiercer. He's in the host, I think, as well. Yeah, yeah, he is. He looks amazing yeah. in the host because he has like peroxide blonde hair and he's wearing like a hoodie. He's so good in the host. But yeah, um, I really like the movie. Probably not as into it as a lot of people, but like you know, it's it's got a lot of accolades, and I think it deserves them. Yeah, it's it's fucking crazy that it won like all those Oscars. Like, yeah, that's, that was that's nuts. I really hope it doesn't get an American remake. Ugh, ugh. can't wait! Finally, the perfect movie <laughs> starring Seth Rogen. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm rich. Yeah, I'll do to your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, and here's my sister, Uma Thurman. <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> Who do you want to cast? Name? Oh, uh, uh, Ro- Rose, Rose, Rose Byrne should be oh, in it because yes. Seth Rogen and Rose Byrne mm-hmm. are always in those fucking Rose movies. Byrne, rich mom. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, directed by Paul Feig, and he's wearing his dicky bow on set, and he's like, "I'm gonna make this a real masterpiece." Sorry, I hit the wall again. It's okay. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> Sorry, wall. Um, Neve, I'm very curious about this mysterious item you've put on here just called Orchestra Update oh yes yeah. I wanted a little update uh, last uh, episode I said I went to the near orchestra and I asked what the dealio was with everyone on stage looking like they are right handed and what do left handed musicians do do left handed musicians just not play in orchestra that much and the the answer that so many people very graciously explained to me in many different ways um, from many different musical backgrounds and non-musical backgrounds is uh, it's basically conformity. It's like there is left-handed players there. They just are taught how to play on right-handed instruments. And there's very few left-handed instruments in the world. And if you are a left-handed player, you just learn on a right one and... It's kind of a little disappointing, I guess, because like it's kind of sad that it's about conformity, but also it makes perfect sense. Of course, you could just learn it that way um, and not have a left-handed instrument. I did go on a website that was a specifically a left-handed musician's website where they really railed against this as a concept, uh, and they kind of like said that soloists should go out and get left-handed instruments. Um, because it would just like eke out that little bit of their talent you know if you're at that skill level um, that you just want to get that little bit more out but like bigger orchestras you're all going to be playing the same way no matter what is your dominant hand Um, maybe smaller orchestras will let you play in the opposite way but anyway interesting Um, thank you everyone who taught me about that I was very curious and I liked getting all the interesting explanations it's nice having like a human powered Google machine, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I love crowdsourcing information. Yeah. <laughs> um You both watched Horse Girl. Yeah. So can I can I can I tell you about my experience with Horse Girl? Yeah. Real quick. Michelle told me she was watching Horse Girl and I was like, Oh well Alison Bruce, that'd be cool. Um so I was I was feeling a little tender, it had a kind of long day, and I was like, Okay. Maybe Horse Girl would be like a kind of fun movie to watch. I walk in, I see Alison Brie's face for like, I'd say maybe 10 seconds. She did not look like she was having a good time. And I turned around and walked out and was just like, no, not tonight. You definitely need to be in the right mood to watch Horse Girl. Mm-hmm. 
I think this is one of my favorite films of all time. Oh, that's really? awesome. Yeah, I, 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 I love I, this movie. I really, really enjoyed it, but um, uh, I, I, no, like it's a very, very good film. Uh, a horse, like, like I, I, I've been thinking about it so much. To me, it is like, it is. I didn't know what it was. It was just on Netflix, and I was just like, I'll watch it. I like Alison Brie, and I like all the stuff she's been doing with Netflix, like Glow. I uh, love how she's not afraid to take roles that make her look like she's on fire yeah no this is this is like what i was gonna say this is like extremely a character piece and i love that alison brie like really picks these strong character roles i wasn't a big fan of glow season one but season two is so amazing and so is season three and it's just all thanks to the really strong character writing alison brie in horse girl seems like she's having the time of her life like this is a role she wanted to play and she is giving it her all to me, Horse Girl is somewhere between Russian Doll and Anni- Annihilation. Whoa. <laughs> uh, I, no, I, I, I actually do get where you're coming from with mm-hmm. that because because the film is quite cerebral uh, in it, the third act. Yeah, it's like it's it's about this like normal girl who you think has this normal life, um, but it's actually really about mental health and losing touch with reality, but also being aware that you are. But also your reality is your reality. So you're just like, like this kind of desperate, like, please tell me what I'm seeing is real or this is real. And it's weird because it's a fine line to walk because mm-hmm. I've seen a bunch of films with that exact concept, but it can feel very hokey very quickly. Yeah. yeah you know like, what I mean? Like, like the, this film is not quirky yeah, at all. Yeah. yeah. No, this but is... Even, even ones to try and play it straight sometimes can just be really like, oh, come on. I really I mean? think it's Alison Brie's performance yeah. in this. She brings a like adept to that character she looks so pained that's that's what happened to me like i just looked in her face and i was just like yeah. i can't fucking do this yeah, right now you like, know she doesn't look like alison brie no, either it was she's like, like a super pretty lady she's like transformed her like eyes or cheeks or something where she looks like 10 percent off yeah so you're mm-hmm. like is that alison brie because like the first time i saw the trailer i was like that woman looks like alison brie but kind of like a sad version of her <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out to be Alison Brie because uh, like I really liked her in Community she's my favourite character in Community mm. and she was great in Mad Men as well that poor woman in Mad Men what's the name of the woman who plays Captain Marvel uh, uh, Brie, Brie Larson. Larson so I learned this week that Brie Larson and Alison Brie not the same person no and no. they're also both in episodes of Community is, is Brie Larson in Community? Brie Larson plays uh, a guest starring girlfriend of who's the uh Dan, the hair, Danny, the Danny, white hair. Danny, 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 Danny Pudi's character. What's his? Abed? Anyway. Yeah. Oh, Abed. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was like, a, okay. Uh, crazy. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> but I was never a big fan of Community, but I watched every episode. I, I really liked Community at the time. Um, even the Yahoo series. I love that Yahoo <laughs> yeah, series. That That's good. a good season. <laughs> what the fuck was I really, going on there? <laughs> I really liked how they referred to the previous season as the gas leak year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> did you did you did you guys know any horse girls growing up? I guess I was a horse girl to a degree, except without the money. Oh. I could ride a horse because you know there's there's two type of people who own horses uh, rich people and poor people <laughs> and, yeah, and no one in the, in the middle, middle. None. Yeah. so I had a lot of friends who just had a horse in their garden you know like oh there's just this cart horse who's there and you're just like cool I'll ride that uh, and that's fine no one's like there's no saddle no one's telling you to stop you just fall off the yeah. horse and I feel like in your older years Neve, I think I think horse riding could be a good good aesthetic choice for you i used to do i uh, used to do a bit of horse riding mm. yeah. um yeah like I, I knew a lot of people who had horses because i was around a lot of form uh, farmland and stuff and just a lot of people who had them in their garden <laughs> um but uh yeah i i think the american concept of a horse girl is a completely different thing though than what we're thinking of though because to me it's like because like i have two sisters and they were into horse riding but i'd know some of their friends and like as a teenager you'd notice that they weren't they 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 still stayed as interested in horses as they were when they were kids mm. and that any kind of yearning for like adulthood or romance or anything was still focused on horses yeah very kind of tightly wound yeah, very and, invested in the horse riding lifestyle yeah, yeah. And, and, and and so there's an innocence and naivety to them 
where they're a bit underdeveloped in some ways, but... A roaring passion for horses, in yes. other ways. Uh, and to me, that's what a horse girl is. And maybe scented notepaper. Yeah. Yeah. And dotting the eyes with love hearts. A lot, like. of, a lot of variety in the scented love, love mm-hmm. paper drawer. Um, the, the, the horse girl in Horse Girl, it's really sad because she keeps visiting this horse that she keeps calling her horse. And it's clearly at a horse riding school. And the people there are just kind of putting you, up with her. And the yeah. more you, more it goes on, you just kind of, and I think that was like, that was what that was great about the extended cast is there was this unspoken pity. And that was kind of your first clue into something not being wholly right. With oh, that sounds things. great. I felt so bad for her roommate. Yeah. And there was the bit where she was like, Sarah, not now. Because she was going off on a tangent about that the 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 the, the, the uh, TV show within the movie that is just supernatural meets CSI. Yeah, and she's just like this like like this person who's obsessed with this really bad like fantasy TV show, and it's like it is just a stand-in for supernatural. It's like there's something there's some something so real about this character, and it it re- I found the story touching and really like powerful to me. Uh, personally uh it, it's upsetting in a lot of yep. ways like it's it's a ride of a movie it kind of keeps going and you're just like oh fucking god do you know what do you know what i really liked about this movie and because it's produced by the duplass brothers and they're known for mumblecore movies which are like they're indie movies but they're kind of boring because the dialogue is just kind of it's mumbly and improvised i thought the script in this like some of the dialogue is so fucking funny mm-hmm. the bit where the guy's talking about his concept album baker's dozen <laughs> was so so fucking good and i i really really love all those characters in their dialogue i think mm. for me what kind of like maybe lose interest is that in the last third it takes a hard turn and becomes its own thing i really really miss the dialogue but i i, I guess the movie is it, it, you know, it takes the reins, and that horse is galloping, and yep. <laughs> you are uh, I, 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 either along for it or not. But it's a fantastic film. I was fully along, and I, I really recommend people check out Horse Girl. I think Michelle really, really enjoyed it as well. I, I'm so glad this film exists. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, the guy, the guy who made it, because uh, uh, it's written by Alison Brie as well. The guy directed Life After Beth, which is a really good film. Have you seen that one? No. <laughs> It's about a guy whose girlfriend dies, but then there's a zombie apocalypse, so she comes back. Oh, and, Jesus. And then she's played by Aubrey Plaza. Oh, it's oh a, wow. It's really... That's, a, that's, that's sounds, some fantastic yeah. casting. Yeah, it, it's a very funny film. Uh, it, it's played by... And, and, and the boyfriend is the guy who was the Green Goblin in the second Amazing Spider-Man movie, or the Hobgoblin. Remember him? No. No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Um, that sounds good. Good film. Good film. Guys, I watched Mythic Quest Raven's Banquet. I, I watched a bit of this too. So this is the new show from Rob McElhenney yep. um, and Charlie Day. Is Charlie Day part of it as well? He's an executive producer on it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and another one where I was like, I feel like I had very set expectations going into this in that I thought I was walking into an, an another Always Sunny, like that kind of tone. And it's really not that. This is a sitcom about a game development studio that has this massively successful online game called Mythic Quest. And the first episode is about them launching their expansion pack, Raven's Banquet. The game is basically World of Warcraft. Um, How much of it did you watch, Brian? Just the first episode. And it seemed to get some stuff right and then other stuff not right at all. Yeah, yeah. That's... That is a thing with this show. There's definitely people on staff who know the games industry and know it well, but then there's other people, there's, there's, there's other like kind of plot solutions and writing that like really don't add up if you know this stuff. And I know that like us on this podcast, as well as the people who listen to this podcast are probably going to be more tuned into that stuff than your average viewer. So like, I get it. I get that they don't, there's certain kind of allowances they want to give themselves. But um, but wouldn't that be the audience as well? Like, it's about games. Mm, it's it's, it's like, about games yeah. in the same way The Office is about running an office. Okay. Um, and so 
the kind of there's no real main character but i guess like the central figure at the start of it is rob McElhenney's character and he's real like auteur hugely like narcissistic game developer like he's he's like um he's like todd howard david cage is the todd howard he's that kind of guy and um as the series goes on what it kind of becomes about is his relationship with his lead programmer poppy lee and she's like um she's kind of a human train wreck a little bit and she's kind of she's really super talented but she also just does not have her shit together at all but then neither does he and neither does really anyone in the studio i really like ashley birch's character who's in love with the other play tester yeah um ashley birch is really really good in this but this is kind of the strength of this show as well there's points where like maybe the like the writing isn't great and there's points where maybe some of the jokes don't land but the general performances in this are so fucking strong like every member of the main cast is really like giving it everything they have and I wanted to shout out in particular Poppy Lee's character because she hasn't really been in anything else mm. she was in, in two films like seven years ago uh, her name's Charlotte Nick- Nickdow I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right but she like she's this tiny little girl who just has so much rage at having to be like the person who has to make things work in this studio and she gets better and better as it goes on and it's fantastic and um, the girl ashley birch is brilliant as well she's a play tester and then she has a crush on on on, on the other girl play tester in it and the two of them are like the cutest fucking couple yeah like holy shit um it, it, it's, it's also got danny pooty in it as the marketing guy but his hair is different oh. yeah um, he's, he's the one character where like i'm nearly at the end of season three i feel like they haven't really figured him out yet season or episode, or, episode? Se- season one i'm at the end of season one sorry. season one yeah um I, I i like the washed up writer who's played by f murray abramson he's another character who like he delivers some lines and if you think about the lines it's like yeah it's pretty funny i guess but he delivers them with such like vigor he's a really like well-established actor oh like, he's in amadeus he, yeah. he plays the bad guy in amadeus yeah. like i think he's won an oscar <laughs> yeah um there is stuff that like there is some stuff that kind of bothered me about it. I do think it gets off to a slow start. I didn't. I, I thought the first episode was okay. I thought the second episode was better. And then the third episode, I felt like they really bit off more than they could chew because the third episode is they find out that there's a like, community of Nazis <gasps> in their game, which, like, cool, do an episode on yeah. that. Yeah, sure. Like, that's, that's a problem. But I felt like the way they kind of tackled it was sort of toothless. And then their solution is to make a separate server and, like, confine all the Nazis to that server. And it's, like, if you've played any attention to this stuff, when you give, like, bigots and racists, uh, like, online space in which they can gather, it doesn't tend to go great. And I thought that was really tone deaf. And that's at the point where I was nearly, like, maybe this show isn't for me. But from there, I really felt like it went kind of from strength to strength. And there's a really great episode that's completely disconnected from every other episode. And it's just about two indie developers making a game and the game getting more popular and the effect that has on their relationship. And it's good. It's really good. That's a good idea. And um, it's weird because, like, when I watch Always Sunny, it's like, I'd say in a 20-minute episode of Always Sunny, I'm going to laugh, like, four or five times. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's going to be at least a couple of really really good jokes this isn't like that like there is maybe one really good joke in episode but by the end of it i was nearly just more invested in like kind of the characters and their story than i was and like it's the first season of like a sitcom i always think they they like it, it takes at least a season to get on your feet by the end of this i was invested and by the end of it i actually really liked it um, and I'm really look. I hope they do a season two, and I hope they continue to kind of push forward with the way they do. Because I actually had a lot of fun with this one, and I've only got one episode left. I'm kind of sad it's over now. Not going to be for everyone. Like I think it'll probably irritate some people because like there is shit in it that doesn't land. But I re- I liked it, and I- I'd be super curious as to both your thoughts on it. Yeah, it's something I will definitely give a give a watch to. It's kind of weird. I haven't seen anything about it. Like, he came out at E3 and, you know, yeah. kind of launched it. But I haven't seen many people talk about it. Apparently, it was meant to come out in October and then it got delayed. Yeah. Oh. And then it just sort of kind of got released quietly. Yeah, on, it feels like it was on, sneaked out. 
uh, because it, it was meant to launch with Apple TV because that launched in December, I think. It launched with like two big shows. Yeah. And then they launched one or two other shows, and this is one of the other original programs. I, I hope it gets its due because it is good, and like there, it it looks really nice. Like it's nicely shot, and it's, it's it's got a good set, great set. Yeah, I think the title's kind of bad in terms of. I know what they're doing. I know it's, it's an expansion for a game and stuff, but it does just sound like an expansion for kind of a know nothing game. Like you know, it's it's a hard thing to remember to search. Yeah, it feels like a mobile game. Yeah, yeah. Mythic Quest Raven's Banquet. Yeah, um, yeah, and that is the problem with it. Like, it it can just be a little bit on the nose with stuff. And like, there's some stuff like, say, Poppy, she's meant to be the lead programmer. She also seems to be the lead animator. Oh, and so it's like, oh, fucking <laughs> whoa, like no, no. And then like, you know, the testers are these two girls who have like an entire room to themselves and just sit there playing games all day. And it's like, from what I understand about testing, it fucking sucks. But um. The good with this show really outweighed the bad, and I actually ended up, like, really super digging it. Mainly for the characters. The characters are all just cute and fun. This is a, le- it's a lesbian subplot, and even I haven't really been paying attention, but you seem to have some kind of affinity to the lesbian culture. Or what? It's okay. Yeah, okay. Like, I'll dip my toe in now. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, Brian, yeah. tell us about Primal. Okay, just real quick. I watched Gendy Taratovsky's Primal. Uh, I think it's season one... The first half of season one, and it's like five or six episodes uh, came out in the last year, and I really, really enjoyed it. Did you, did you guys? Did you guys ever watch this, or did you just see the a, footage of it? I haven't just downloaded. seen the footage. Yeah. Okay. Like I love Dexter's Lab. I think that's my favorite thing he's ever made, and like I have huge respect for Samurai Jack. But like, this is fantastic. This is, this is, this has got the same thing with Samurai Jack. Where like, for me, my favorite parts of Samurai Jack was like not the battles but just him walking quietly and there'd be no dialogue or anything and it would just be setting something up this one bit of Samurai Jack where he walks up a creaky stairs it's fucking awesome yeah so Primal has no dialogue at all and it's about a caveman and his relationship with a T-Rex and he lost his family she lost her family they fucking hate each other they're best fucking friends and it is sold and but it's a show about predator and versus prey and it is just about how awful the food chain is and how when you feel at your safest that's when you're gonna lose everything it's rough um but like in terms of animation it's done by a very small team and like the storyboards and like the art direction and color are fantastic the animation is good but the drawings themselves are fantastic and there is there there are some amazing fight scenes later on and there's you see someone's face getting you, you see someone's face getting kicked and the skin off their face falls off their skeleton no. it's good stuff thanks animation like the skin actually tears off oh yeah and you get to see like it's very well animated um i think it's on Owl swim but like you know the way most Owl swim shows are like oh i have a big dick blah blah you know it's just that kind of humor <laughs> yeah the good stuff yeah um I think this is cool where it's like it's violent but it's it's meant to be very viscerally violent because it's about so it's not like wacky violence there's some like humor to it like like it, it's definitely got a sense of humor but it yeah. doesn't have jokes okay. let's say it's more like the comedy of life yes mm-hmm. uh and, and it does have some nuance and it's it, it's very good at like telling a story with just visuals and you get invested in these characters that don't talk and you don't really know that much about, but you've made up your own narrative in your head about them. Sure. It, it, it's got some, like... Well, I guess the first episode has some kind of, like, very obvious flashbacks, and you're kind of like, oh, this is a bit student filmy, but it does kind of find its feet in the latter half, and I think they're going to do a, a second batch of episodes, and I don't know what's going to happen next, because, like, it's kind of like Berserk, where it just goes real bad. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not good. So let's see how they fall down even harder okay that sounds awesome it's really really good I really enjoyed it okay and that's going to do it for our quest log which means it's time for strategy talk Neve, we've both been playing Kentucky Route Zero 
I have been very curious to your take on this. Yeehaw! Uh, how much more have you played of it? Uh, I'm on episode three. Okay. I was sick, so I haven't played much of this. I tried so hard to play this game, and every time I played it, I fell asleep. <laughs> like, I had one eye, like, my right eye was trained on the TV, and my left eye kept rotating inside my head. <laughs> I was like, no, gotta play Kentucky Road Zero. <laughs> this game is borderline visual novel. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's like, it is, <laughs> it's a NyQuil. <laughs> like, like, as I, a game. I, like, what I would say, That's I think maybe, maybe I said this last time, but if you're thinking about getting this game, you would best approach it with the mindset that it is a book you are going to read. Yeah. Yeah. Uh it's 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 very visually stunning. It's a it's it's it it's done with very block shapes and really yeah. dark shapes and a lot of strong silhouettes and framing with silhouettes. Yeah. Yeah. You are a truck driver who is delivering a package and he needs to uh reach the zero, route zero, and he needs to find his way there and meets a cast of interesting characters who kind of don't help no <laughs> but you learn um a lot of little stuff about them um you were saying last episode where it does a thing where it's kind of nearly you build your own narrative for these people where you'll have like three dialogue options mm. and it could be like you have your dog at the start and it's like his name is something or her name is blue uh, and you know you can you can kind of build what the story is by that and i picked blue so my dog is blue from here out and that like keeps getting goes more and more i don't know if i love that I understand um, it really brings this kind of floaty feel to everything. Like, everything seems dreamlike, like the kind of how mythic far, Route Zero. Far... Finished episode one. Okay. Um, that hasn't come in too much more. And it's more just like, I think it's more like, as opposed to deciding what this character's existence is, it's more like shining a light into the part of the character's life you want to experience. So are you talking to her mom? Are you talking to her debt collector or her ex, you know? Yeah, I guess. But then it feels like, you know, that the other part isn't important. Like you kind of have to choose what's what you think would be more interesting kind of thing where mm -hmm. the game isn't kind of telling you what it thinks is interesting I don't know I found it fine for your character because you're embodying that character yeah. but whenever I got to make those decisions as another character yeah. I didn't particularly like it because I was like I, don't, I kind of wanted the game to tell me about them you know yeah. um, but that's it's like it's so not a big deal it's such a small aspect of the game yeah and it's not an aspect of the game I particularly enjoy or disdain mm -hmm. you know and like it actually I don't think it really featured much at all in episode two. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you feel since you you found one kind of slow? I think, in hindsight, I, I, I think I went home that night and beat episode one, and I think I nearly could have put the game down after episode one. I really, really? just wasn't feeling it. And then I played episode two, and I enjoyed it a lot more. Um, I, like... I don't. I think it's kind of unfair to call episode one a misstep because it was made probably before the people making the game even knew what the fuck they were doing. You know, like nearly t I think ten years ago or something. Ridiculous. Seven. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, but then episode two, I found a lot more intriguing, and a lot of the stuff that they started doing in episode one that I like. I hated the map shit in episode one. Mm. I kept getting lost. I didn't know what I was meant to do. They start doing some zany shit with the map. And it's still the two. same map kind of thing. Kind of. Okay. Like, really... I hate comparing it to Twin Peaks so much, but I feel like if you taught David Lynch how to make games, he'd do this kind of shit. Okay. Like, really playing with the idea of what a map even is. Hmm. Um... Just to give people a visual for this, the the map that you traverse around, you're going around in your truck. You don't even a little have an icon of a truck. It's like a little wheel. Yeah. And you just bring it down white lines on a map. And it's kind of just like the veins of a map. Yeah. And then like there's a lot more surreal moments in episode two as well, where they're really going for stuff. Um, and so going into episode three, I, I was more intrigued. Now, I still didn't really have, honestly, a great sense of these characters or even what the game's going for. But then by episode three, and I'm early on in episode three, but like 
even the way episode three opens up, it's like, what the f- Oh, okay, that's what we're doing now? And so I kind of, then there was like a lot of the early part of episode three is a lot of just watching a conversation play out. But even like listening to what these people are talking about and how natural it all felt, I really did feel like I was overhearing a conversation between two people and they were experiencing like a very relatable universal plight that is affecting a lot of people right now. And a lot of it was like how easy someone can get trapped in like debt. Mm. And it was very simple, but in a way... Because like, I, I, like, this is the kind of cool thing about the game. Now I'm thinking about like debt a lot. And like, you know, the in, in Ireland, like debt is not as big a problem as it is in the US because you don't come out of college in debt. You know, there's public health care. But like, you know, one of the characters was just talking about like he took a bad spill and he's in debt and that's just what he is now. And he's buried under debt just because of this one unfortunate incident. And whatever way it was about the scene, it kind of drove it home to me in a way I don't think that I've ever really considered debt because I've never had to, you know? And I thought that was really cool. Um, I still think I'm probably at the point where I'm appreciate, appreciating this game more than I'm enjoying it. But yeah, like there's something here and I'm going to see it through for sure. Um, Yeah, I'll definitely see it through uh, as well. I like its visuals so far. I'm not in love with it yet, but as I said last week, last podcast, I I have heard the first episode is kind of the slowest one and you're kind of, it's introducing you to a tone kind of thing. Yeah. Um, But not enamored so far. We'll keep going with it. What you've said about episode two and three, kind of sounds way more interesting yeah i was a lot more engaged with episode two and i would already say i'm a lot more engaged with episode three than i was with episode two because like the kind of lynchian stuff that you experience in episode one like when you go around the map you can kind of stop at different points and you might get a little vignette like for example there's like two guys pushing a plane and they just push it across the screen and it like comes up a little dialogue box that they've like no shoes and the wheels are coming off the plane and suddenly they'll be dragging it and i was just like I don't care. Like, I just thought it was a cool image. And I was like, can I leave? Like, it wasn't, I'm not so bought into the vibe of it yet that that was interesting. I was just like, let me, let me, let me find fucking Route Zero. (laughs) Yeah. I guess where, like, I, I think I missed that, whatever it was. But where I'm at, I think I get a little more what they were going for. Mm. Um, And it's kind of interesting, all right. But I think we're we're also at kind of similar places with this game. I, I think I, I do want to like it because, like, it's a weird, cool thing. I'm still very much on the edge, but I'm a lot closer to liking it than I was. I know I'm just on the first episode, but part of me is wondering, is, is maybe Kentucky Route Zero a time and a place kind of thing? Like, if we'd played this seven years ago where there wasn't a lot of these type of games... I think seven years ago this would have blown my fucking mind. Yeah, like, like are we coming into it so late with so much other experiences that are kind of similar that, like, it'll never have that kind of same effect? Yeah. You know, like, part of me wait. wishes I had played this before I played, like, Deadly Premonition. Yeah. You know? Um, but uh, let's just see. Like, um, I'm, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see where it goes. Brian, yeah, why don't you tell us about a game? Uh, okay, I'll talk about two Sonic games. Is that okay? I'm Jesus Christ, bro. I'm really feeling Sonic right now. I can see that. I'm turning a little bit blue. I've got some gloves on, and I'm going real fast. Um, I played two Sonic games. I played Sonic Adventure Two Battle, and I played Sonic the Hedgehog Three. So I'll talk about Sonic Adventure 2 Battle first. This is a game that if you asked me a couple months ago, would you rather play Sonic Adventure 2 Battle or Super Mario Sunshine? I'd be like, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, absolutely, because that game is fucking hilarious. Interesting. Because I just think like they're the same age, roughly. They're about 18 years old, both of those games, 19 years old. Um... Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they came out at the beginning of the 2000s, like 2001, 2002. Um, I went back and played Sonic Adventure 2 Battle on my lunch breaks at work, and the cutscenes in that game are very bad and funny, and it's a good game to, like, so bad it's good. Mm-hmm. Those parts are good. Gameplay-wise, it's you're screaming at it. Like, it's not fun to play. So are we talking all the gameplay modes? Okay, so I guess... 
Sonic Adventure 2 Battle tries to go for a thing where it drops you in the middle of the narrative and tries to piece it back together and you have to play as multiple characters to understand the full story and get the proper ending. Yeah. You play fast levels as Sonic and Shadow. You play slow levels in a mech as Tails and Eggman. Dr. Eggman. To me, he'll always be Robotnik. And then you play treasure treasure hunting finding levels as Knuckles and Rouge the Bat. And they're all not fun in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Sonic levels are fun. You'd think so. I, no, it's been a... It's been a while. Okay. And, you know, and there's very little of them. It's Oh, most, yeah. Those levels are short. Uh, there's maybe three or four of those. Like, Sonic, you barely play a Sonic in the game. And there's, like... You might play for a couple hours and there's no Sonic at all. It's just, like... And those fucking Rouge Knuckles levels go on. They do. And, on and, and, on. and they're randomly generated each time, so... You can't guide them. No, so... you you, you, you and, you're, and you're playing hot and cold with a meter trying to find... Oh, they're so bad. Three parts of a Master Chaos Emerald. Yep. Um, like, I do think the cutscenes are the best part. But at that point, you could just be watching the game on YouTube... Like, it's not a fun game to play now, and it's broken as fuck, and the camera is constantly trying to go in the direction you don't want to go. And Do you know you- there's there's basically a sub-community of video essays defending that game on YouTube? Like, like, like it, it, it makes some interesting decisions, and... I, I really wish I liked I, I really wish this game aged well and I could be one of those people celebrating Sonic but like you have to look at this game and see it's not fun the multiplayer is fun the multiplayer is fun yeah, yeah. Uh, there's also kart racing but the car, the camera is oh, down nice. <laughs> the camera is down so low that the cart is kind of like cut off by the bottom of the screen like it's just like there's something wrong with every time like it, it, it's, it's just like there is no portion of this game that just works no, because there's, yeah, it, it almost works, but but there's a caveat to everything in it. Um, I wouldn't play Sonic Adventure Two Battle again. Oh no! And and like I love the music. Rouge the Bat's fucking amazing. Oh, she's the best. She's one of the best. Where do you guys stand on like Rouge the Bat slash Knuckles or Rouge the Bat slash Shadow? Okay, so I I've, I've been doing a deep dive on the Sonic Wiki. Okay. Okay. This I'm is, excited. This is the Sun fan, fan wiki. Okay, so Rouge the Bat. Yeah. Uh-huh. Her best friend. Okay. Is Shadow the Hedgehog. Okay. Oh. Like that's cute. Like they're best fucking friends. But it's not like a romantic thing. No, but you, you know, you know how Shadow is a very uh, prickly guy, like physically and emotionally. Yes. And you wouldn't think he'd have any friends. He seems like a loner. Yeah. He's best friends with Rouge the Bat, a hundred percent. Then Rouge the Bat has a friendly rivalry with Knuckles. Has a rivalry with Amy Rose and has... That's not a fucking rivalry. Rouge the Bat is better than Amy Rose in I, every conceivable way. I think it's just two female characters competing for a male character's attention trope. That's that rivalry. And then she has no relationship with Sonic. <laughs> Which I think is really funny. I love it for new She's Sonic so... game if Rouge just showed up and Sonic was like, Who's that? Yeah, like like it, 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 it's pretty much like Frodo and Legolas in the Lord of the Rings movies. Like those two guys don't know each other, even though they're involved in like a bigger thing. Um, I I just think Rouge the Bat is a very important fictional character. And, oh, she's amazing. And I I I, I, I mean, what's that really, expression? I just like that shadows Gimli. <laughs> yeah, he is. He is Gimli. In that <laughs> he's really old as well. Like he's not doing, yeah. Um. I don't know. Um, I I I was kind of a bit underwhelmed by this game, but Rouge the Bat saved it. Ah, uh, Rouge the Bat's a treasure. She is. She's great in the comics. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, meanwhile, we also played Sonic the Hedgehog Tree. This is the third Sega Genesis Sega Mega Drive Sonic game that was split into two parts because it was developed alongside Sonic and Knuckles, and they mixed and matched the levels and released one in one year and then the fu- it's so- fucking crazy when you think about what they did now yeah cause like back then Sega released a Sonic game annually every year from like 1991 to 1994 probably probably 95 with Sonic CD as well and then it just sort of like stopped because they had to kind of get with the times of the new technology and Sonic didn't appear on the Saturn instead it was Knights and that was a whole thing but like Sonic 3 I guess is the middle game of a consistent Sonic platformer series and it's just like I think it's 
one of the best Sonic, or it, it, it's just one of the best games from that time in general. It's it's aged super well, and it's some of the visual shit they do with Sonic with him like moving. Yeah, it it, it looks like in three D, even though it's not. But it's got this one bit right where because because Knuckles keeps like tricking on you, mm. where he'll press a button and you fall down, and then brings you to the next zone. But there's a bit at the end where you finally like get your revenge on Knuckles and he topples over. But they've animated his head like turning in perspective. And it's just this really nice detail on a sprite, but like they really went the extra mile. Yeah, I, I feel like whenever I play those games I'm always shocked at how much shit they did. Yeah. Um, um and no, it, it's just a really like I'm, it's just so interesting to play two Sonic games and one is aged not very well and then the other one is aged just so gracefully and it's still yeah. so accessible. Um did I tell a story in the podcast about that time I bought Sonic comics? Yeah, a couple of weeks back with the, the with with the IDW Sonic comics. Uh-huh. There, yeah. Okay. Just I, I like to me, Sonic kind of has a good pile and a bad pile, and like stuff like Sonic 06 and Sonic Unleashed are in the bad pile, and then you got like like genuinely good Sonic stuff, like 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 the comics. Um, well, some of the comics. And some of the classic games, but then you've got like the weird movie, the weird movie that's kind of like I just Sonic's such a weird thing now, yeah. You know, because like when you think of Mario, for the most part, except those old old cartoons, it's Mario. You know exactly what you're going to get with Mario. He's fairly consistent. There's so many different iterations of Sonic, like, like in you know official shit. But then, like the f- it, what the internet has done to Sonic the Hedgehog as well. Yeah, I think it's the power of making a Sonic OC. Like no one wants to like have a little Italian um, plumber as their. Can you imagine <laughs> avatars? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if they released like Mario Forces in which you make your own plumber? Like, Mario yeah. is you a are species, the third brother. He's a species of creature. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you can like change the pitch of his voice so it's like or it's like Whoa. Um, I, I actually do like Luigi that he's a bit of a like he, he kind of belongs more to the internet than Mario does oh yeah completely and people are kind of like what's going on there yeah yeah whereas, whereas with Mario he's like Mickey Mouse it's like whatever yeah Luigi has the freedom to be more of a character where Mario always has to be an ambassador yeah and I, I just think like Sonic just wasn't there for a while, similar to how Luigi kind of like took a step back yeah. with a lot of the mainline Mario games. Luigi was not playable or present. Uh, Sonic just was not like Sega just didn't make Sonic games for a while, so people filled in the gaps themselves. So I was trying to figure this out for a while. Is Sonic the first like tood character? I think he Bart. is. Oh yeah, yeah, Bart. no Bart. Yeah, 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 yeah he's Bart. based on Bart, isn't he? Um, I mean that makes sense they took like bits of like because they wanted yeah. to make a competitor character and they took kind of bits of what was cool they I think he's, wanted, I think like, he's the, the edge first of like an yeah, animal mascot attitude sunglasses shit how about Chester Cheeto and stuff like that for like brands I think that came or, or, yeah yeah do you think they came after because yeah, they, they were like air, they were 2000s it. I think oh maybe Chester Cheeto's like like from 1920 oh he could I think Chester <laughs> yeah Chester Cheeto's yeah, because like I'm trying, I'm trying to think of like Seven Up because they had Fido Dido, and he's pretty old, but like he's never been he, like he an doesn't attitude. Have tude though, he's yeah, chill. He's coo- yeah, 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 he's yeah. chill. He's yeah, chill. Yeah. yeah, no, it's got to have tude. Because uh, I was trying to think of all like the animal mascots, and I was like, like in that exact vein, and I came up with like Sonic the Hedgehog, Raphael, and Shawn Michaels. <laughs> I do really like when Sonic is like feels right. But then I also like when he feels wrong for different reasons because it's fun as well. Yeah. Chester Cheeto, uh, Chester Cheetah first appeared in 1986. Fucking hell. He's been a cool guy for a long time. Wow, I never would have thought he came before Sonic. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, because Sonic's, what, 27 years old now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 28. Um, Okay, Brian, thanks for telling us about the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. Neve, you saw a movie movie. called... (laughs) And we're in the game section. We're a video portrait game. Portrait of po- a lady on fire. <laughs> we're a yeah. video game podcast. Neve, portrait of a lady on fire. You went too fast and you've circled all the way around. <laughs> um, Neve, how's Destiny going? Uh, Destiny is still very much Destiny, but because I was sick and very, very, very sick, all I could really do was 
play some Destiny, then go, oh, and then sleep for an hour, then play some that. Destiny. Like, I couldn't really watch stuff. When you're too sick to enjoy media. Yeah, yeah, it sucked. But Destiny got me through it, and specifically Gambit. And I wanted to shout out the Gambit mode. I, in three days, I maxed out my Infamy rank, which is a thing that goes up by playing more and more matches. And if you play Destiny, you know I've played a lot of matches if I maxed out my Infamy got to my legend whatever but uh, I really want to shout out Gambit I love that mode it's a mix of PvE versus PvP so you I've been playing Gambit Prime you go into a match it's 4v4 so you take on um, enemy waves they drop moats you bring the moats to a big moat reactor and you drop them in and you need to get a hundred moats and once you get a hundred moats, you launch a prime evil, which is a giant boss. And now the two teams, like they're you're, they're working on their each of their prime evils. Um, whoever kills their prime evil first wins. So the first part is the first person to a hundred moats. Second part is fir- uh, first uh, team to kill their prime evil. And you can go through a portal into the other teams, the opposing team's world and kill the players and every death you cause heals their prime evil. That's wild. What the fuck? So it's a really just uh, and Gambit's been in it for a while but like I haven't played much of it or too much of it but I really got into it. Had a really fun time. I love the mix of PVP and PVE and just taking different roles if you're a moat collector, if you're t- like just damaging things and taking them out. It was a fun time. Um just uh, just wanted to give it a shout out for the people who give a crap about Destiny. Uh, I'm still having a lot of fun with it. What I will say is I haven't been playing a lot since Bungie and Activision had their split and I like I have Shadowkeep but I hadn't been I haven't been playing it. Ha- I think the servers have gotten way worse. I was consistently dropping while I was playing and the servers were down for hours at some points. And it wasn't this bad. And I don't know if it was just a me situation or if general the servers are just kind of dog shit since they've split. And that's kind of where you feel that split. Um, apart from some of the other monetization stuff, which isn't too bad. But um, I just thought I'd ask. I love crowdsourcing questions. Other Destiny players, have you noticed a drop in server, server quality? Because I sure have. But yeah, that's my destiny time. And for the people who care, the I'm using a bow most of the time and it's the arsenic bite. I unlocked hush. I don't actually like it that much. I prefer the arsenic bite. And that's it. That's my destiny minute. That's your destiny minute. And from that, we move straight into the Yakuza minute. Guys, I beat Yakuza 2. Yakuza Kiwami 2. Kiwami 2. This isn't the PlayStation 2 version. It's this the is PS4. not the PlayStation 2 version. Although I'm so curious to play that. I'm probably never gonna. But this, this is the one with the female detective. Yes. Um, Sayama, maybe? She has a big collar, that's all Her I know. Her collar is so fucking strange. And every single cutscene, all I, when she's in it, all I can think is, why is your collar so weird? Does she have a popped collar? No, it's like, well, it's, it's kind like of... It's a big ha- giant, like, clown it's, collar. It's a big giant collar, but it's kind of popped at the back. Oh. But it, like, but like out. half of it. So it goes like that. Weird. Yeah, it's it's such a fucking strange there, collar. There must be so much starch in that shirt. And it makes her head look tiny. Yes. And it's 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 weird because they've they do they've done such an amazing she's like Kiryu's love interest. So they've done like you can tell they have like a mid quality model of her head and then a high quality model when like Kiryu's looking into like her big dreamy eyes. And it's really enchanting. But then the camera pulls out and it's like, Oh, why is her head a weird golf ball? <laughs> <laughs> That's um, funny. Yeah, it's so it just I like I I know I shouldn't be this upset about it, but it just it distracted me in every single cutscene, and she's a major character in that game. Uh, this uses the same engine as Yakuza Six, doesn't it? Yeah. Not okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's the kind of more physics based combat. The dragon engine. The dragon engine. Yeah. But yeah, guys, fucking fix that color. Zero out of ten. And um, okay, so. I would drop this game firmly in, like, the mid-tier Yakuza pile. I don't think anyone needs to play this game. Um, The Ryuji, the, like, villain in it, he's great. 
and him and Kiryu are great and they have a very mean fight towards the end and I really really liked it it's like top three Yakuza let's take off our shirts and wrestle fights that's good real good yeah is this one where he punches a tiger as well or two tigers yes yes <laughs> And there's, whole, there's a bit where someone smashes a bottle over his head. That's and he, Ryuji. And he just turns around all grumpy. Yeah. Um, it's good. I, th- I think um, my problem with this game, of why I wouldn't write, rate it as high as some of the other ones, is that it's not really Kiryu's story. It's kind of other characters' story. And I just didn't find the other characters like that interesting. Like kind of Sayama, if, if that, like the, the detective in it. She's fine, but, like, there is just this kind of storyline where, like, she's tough, but Kiryu knows she's a woman underneath. And it's... It's it's shitty. Like, it's not great, yeah. Um, And it did that thing, and this is not the first Yakuza game to do this, but basically, there's inevitably a scene at the end of a Yakuza game where a bunch of people are fighting or pointing guns at each other or whatever the fuck, and then someone walks out and is like, you've all been dancing to my tune. (gasps) I'm the puppet master. There are three puppet master reveals in this game, and they're all in the same 20 minute span. <laughs> and by the time the third one came out, I was like, I have no fucking idea who this character <laughs> is. The subcontext yeah. whiplash. Um, and it was fun. I mean, like, to me, yeah, because the games are just like a warm, comforting bomb. You know, it's, it's like I play them, and I just like Kiryu so much, and I like just fighting in the fighting tournaments and doing stupid side shit. Uh, again, to reiterate, if you have not played the Yakuza series, Yakuza 0 is absolutely the game to start with. Um, that may, Maybe that might change with Yakuza 7 coming out later this year. We will see. But um, yeah, good game. Mid-tier Yakuza game. Do you know Kiryu is in the Sonic movie? What? Um, they have a... Uh, Sega logo and it's done like the the Marvel Cinema logo where it's like a montage of characters. Oh, so they flick through all their games? Yeah, but like they're, they're but but they're silhouetted inside the Sega logo itself and Kiryu is like in in towards the middle. So you see Kiryu on screen. It's I, fucking I don't nuts. Know if I, believe him. I believe him. That face doesn't lie. How much you want to pay? Gonna How pay much, the... I, I want to pay zero. Okay, so someday you'll watch the Sonic movie and you'll see Kiryu in the Two second Sega title opening credits, and you're gonna ring me and go, Brian Kiryu is in it. Okay, I guess we'll see. I'll do no. You're it, not usually this excited when you're telling the truth. The rule is Kirby <laughs> has to be able to swallow and copy Kiryu's ability for him to be in the, <laughs> to be in the piece of media. <laughs> Um, they, they, yeah, <laughs> just I for think, some reason, Kiryu's in it, which I thought was cool. I think they should make an American um, adaptation of the Yakuza games as films, and James Marston is Kiryu. <laughs> what? And he's like, hey, I'm Kiryu Kazuma <laughs> yeah, from, from New York City. Any other names. I hate this idea. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I like what the fuck is going on with Sega and why is Yakuza their main series right now yeah what the fuck happened there because <laughs> yeah, like where, where's Sonic why is it Kiryu is it Kiryu the Hedgehog now what's going on Nagoshi's so cool he, he's he's my favorite gaming asshole he made Super Monkey Ball as well didn't he he did he, yeah he did he had some hands in it I don't know if he directed it or what I think he directed it did he He's really good in those Mega sixty four videos, and he has like prop, like like pure white teeth, but it looks like a mouth guard. I I asked I asked Rocco what he was like, and he said he was really nice. Brilliant. Yeah. Brian, yeah. tell us about Metroid Prime. Uh, I replayed Metroid Prime for the eleventh time. I think I replay that game every few years. Still great. Uh, I beat it in twelve hours. I love the gameplay loop of that, where you're just like, I can't go here yet. And then you get new ability and you're like, where can I go with this? And you remember that place you were an hour ago and you're like, I can go there now. Such a great feeling. Um, I That game is also like 18 years old. And it's one of the few franchises that made the jump from 2D to 3D very successfully. And it's a Western developed game by Retro Studios in Texas. And that is a rare feat for something like that to exist and be like as good as it is. I. I really hope Metroid Prime 4 comes out and it's good someday. 
yeah, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Because um, <laughs> Nintendo were developing it, and then they developed it for a year, went nowhere, and then decided to scrap it and send it to Retro Studios. And Retro Studios take like five or six years to make a game. Mm-hmm. Like, all their games are amazing. Except, Well, I'm not really a big fan of Metroid Prime 3. I love Metroid Prime 1. And Metroid Prime 2 is one of my favorite games ever made. You prefer 2 to 1? Yeah, cool. absolutely. Because uh, there, there are some problems with, like, locations in Metroid Prime 1 that don't really connect to the other locations. So backtracking to get a specific item or something like that kind of breaks the flow. Uh, and I think 2 is way more organic with its... Uh, map layout. I think Maker's Toolkit had a good yeah. episode on Metroid Prime 3 and why it like doesn't feel great. He's he's done all three of them so I, yeah and, and he made them last year and, I, and I, afterwards I rewatched it because he kind of like breaks down the order of things and yeah. like there, there, there is there is a way to like sequence break the game um, but I actually kind of like to play the game the, the way the game tells you like to me playing Metroid Prime is like building a big giant Lego kit where like you kind of follow the instructions but like you feel it's like, a really good way of thinking about it like like but like you're totally cool with it like the one that's really divisive is Metroid Fusion because that game is incredibly linear and you're told constantly go to this waypoint but because the story is so good like, yeah like it, I, it, I get it I, I get why people would be like that but that's such a good game it, but I think it's just because the, the, the original Metroids were kind of like here you are you figure it out and like that's a bit too much freedom where you're like sometimes that's not fun and it, I think it's like finding that balance I think Metroid Prime finds that balance really well I really want to replay Super Metroid Super Metroid is good yeah it, 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 it's on the SNES Mini Metroid. I hope Metroid comes back. Also, maybe. Um, and, and then afterwards, I was reading uploads on Samus. So she is six foot three. Ooh, cool. She weighs over fourteen stone. That's nearly how much I weigh. She's a big woman, uh, and this is without the suit. Nice. Yeah, she's just she's shredded. Just a chunky lady. Yeah. She would murder Master Chief. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I I love Samus. She'd murder Lara Croft. I don't think they'd have to fight. <laughs> <laughs> they both explore caves looking for stuff. Yeah. She'd be like, uh, that's my item pickup. And she'd be like, no, it's not. It's mine. Lara would be like, uh, can I study it first? And she'd be like, okay. And then they'd have a nice friendship where they talk about their artifacts afterwards. And that's my fan fiction. Good for you, Neve. Archaeology yeah. AU. If someone wants to send in fan art of that, you'd really make Neve's day. Just yeah, saying. She'd love it. Yep. Uh, just Samus and Lara, you know, in, in the pits in the depths because Sam must be like I can't translate this and Lara was just like I happen to know every language <laughs> even this alien <laughs> cipher Sam must can only translate stuff if it's in her helmet mm-hmm. even space pirate especially space pirate <laughs> yeah and unfortunately Samus isn't like particular well, like she's strong but like she, she she really does need her suit to kind of like get around the place but yeah I like Metroid I also like Metroid quick time events <laughs> little bit of a slow news it's kind of a slow game time in general like like not much news is not coming out not many big releases i've actually been kind of enjoying backtracking and like going through stuff i want to beat yeah and like kind of just some stuff stuff i kind of like that's why i'm playing kentucky route zero and yakuza kwami 2 yeah i'm trying to beat more games this year because i always find whenever we get to like start them but that's it yeah like i think i played like nearly twice the games you both played last year but I beat like a tiny fraction of them because I think we all game for around similar lengths of time yeah. and I would really like to beat more games um, but anyway news so the first one is Persona 5 Real Royale alters homophobic scenes yeah I, I, was, I was reading up on this yeah um, cool yeah. good those scenes were weird and gross um, I I don't remember those in the game. I I, I might have just like s- not paid attention during that bit. Uh, they're they're brief, but they're just shitty. It's like it, there's like a running gag that like there's these two, um, I guess, gay guys who two very effeminate gay guys, very effeminate gay guys who like chase Ryuji around, and he's like, oh, and it's it's just <laughs> crap. I didn't really like when the statement to this was, um, it was something to the effect of we're gonna update Persona Five for like the sensibilities of this generation and mm-hmm. it's like motherfucker it's the same generation as when Persona 5 came out originally it's yeah, the same it's generation later. Yeah, yeah it's like come on like just be like you know what that was shitty like don't 
pretend it's this other thing where it's like oh, man I remember the days that it was okay to do yeah. stuff they would never it's like it, we, this. you never in Persona 5's life, st- life cycle was this okay mm-hmm. this is just in the western version as well it's, it's, it's a translation thing yeah, yeah which so. is disappointing for like Japanese uh, LGBT fans of this game it's kind of like oh it's you know they still have to contend with this homophobia in this game so, so the characters are still in it, but their dialogue about them, it, like threatening to kidnap Ryuji and yeah. the main character abandoning Ryuji with them, is not in the game. Yeah, because like I like I'm I'm cool with them being in the game. I just don't want it to be predatory. That's all. That's the thing. They were pre- pre- um, they were shown as predatory and also much older than Ryuji. So it's just like just, a whole cocktail of yeah, bad, a lot of bad shit. shitty tropes. But um, yeah, I mean. Yeah, it, it's it's good. They're changing it, but yeah, I, I just thought the the statement that went along with it was a little insincere. Um, Castlevania season three comes to Netflix in March. Yeah, are you, are you excited, John? You love that show. I never finished the second season. Oh my god, John! That guy, that guy likes you. Who? The guy, the guy who made Castlevania with the eyeliner. He does, doesn't he? <laughs> oh shit! I hope he doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> he watches your videos. Uh, oh, ooh, um, hmm. Uh, but yeah, there. Uh, I'm really. In, I'm. I don't of, remember why I didn't finish it. I think I just got distracted. I, I I really like all the video game stuff on Netflix. I've no Addy, interest. I'm, I'm going to finish it. Okay. Yeah. Um. I I I've no interest in watching The Witcher, but it's cool that it's there. And the Dragon Quest movie that we talked about before is on Netflix as well. And maybe we should all watch it sometime. We should. It looks cute. Dragon Quest, your story. Whoa. And it's got a really tough looking slime in the poster, <laughs> which is really funny. Oh, uh, Dragon Quest slimes. They're like the perfect design. Um, Nintendo PlayStation prototype up for auction currently at 350000 to buy Palmer Lucky. I think that's up to four hundred now. No, um, it, it, he's put down 350000 but the final bid with the, with, the, with, with the fees and all of that will be 420000 Wow. So wait, is is Palmer Lucky buying this or selling this? Bidding. On it. <gasps> oh. And, yeah. and so what happened was because I was following the story because I've, I've been following this machine for a couple of years now because I've always wanted to see it in the flesh because it, because it, it, it it's been a magfest before and stuff like that and it was how many was, is there? Just the one <gasps> and it was brought around the place by a father son who tried to get it to run but couldn't and so uh, it's been and so. It, it it it's up on this like pop culture antique bidding website that does a lot of like comic book like like very expensive comic books and animation cells so it, it fits in with that pop culture mem- uh, stuff um uh but there's a bidder who came forward as Palmer Lucky saying that's me with the money down nobody touch it and people are like what are you going to do with it and he's like I'm going to get my team to look at it and try and get it to work and then I want to try and preserve it in my video game preservation project. And then people were like, is this a public thing or a private thing? And he's like, I can't say anything about it. <laughs> so people aren't sure if it's like the right person is going for it or is it just going to be taken by some rich person who will just like... Remember when he was like the darling of the games industry for like four months? <laughs> and then it's like, oh no, you're a weird gross person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so yeah, like 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 people aren't sure what's going on here. Is he, is he just being a bit of an Elon Musk Jr. about the whole thing? I call my figure collection my preservation project as well. Oh really? Because yeah. I call it my don't fuck up fund. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like he does have a good team. Like maybe they could like actually like figure out what that machine is and open it up and make it tick. Because like so far people are like really worried about like pushing it too far because then you'll break something in it. But you, you uh, do want to see if you can get it to work properly because right now it can't. Mm. Um, but yeah, good luck to whoever wins it. Yeah, even less companies and familiar faces at E3. Oh, Kojima fan or Ludens fan Jeff Keeley, <laughs> professional <laughs> Kojima lover Jeff yeah. Keeley, <laughs> won't be at E3, which yeah. is kind of crazy. He's been at it forever, and, and and he said for personal reasons, but wouldn't go beyond that oh he, he also gave some details saying really? he just doesn't think that e3 is headed in the right direction mm-hmm. yeah um because then it says they're going to focus on special guest gamers and celebrities does someone need a social media influencer yeah i, I think it's going to be influencer central i think it's 
it's not about press passes anymore or it's going to be less and less about the press passes it's more about you know we're this, we're influencers yeah i was just like the only way this is this is acceptable is if let's fight a boss is there well who 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 else would they bring i don't know i don't think there are any other like social media influencers in the video game space none yeah so i guess we'll just wait for the tickets to show up <laughs> awesome yeah can't wait because E3 listen to this podcast because you say great <laughs> things about E3 every year. Send well, to- Hideo Kojima listens to it, so Hideo yeah. Kojima would have told Jeff Keighley, would have told E3, yeah. so yeah, they do. We're so good about hype, we're never doubtful about anything in a piece of marketing. I no. just want to consume product. <laughs> On to the next one. Yep. And then, Niamh, this was your uh, special bit of news. Oh, there was a leak for the Resident Evil TV show. This TV show has been kind of rumored forever. People are saying it's a Netflix one, um, but we haven't really heard much about it in a while there was a reported um shooting schedule a while back but this is now a little blurb that appeared um on the netflix website uh, and was uh taken down once people figured it out so it's called resident evil the town of clearfield md has long stood in the shadow of three seemingly unrelated behemoths the umbrella corporation <gasps> the decommissioned Greenwood Asylum and Washington, D.C. Oh, oh no! Not the president, not again. <laughs> Today, 26 years after the discovery of the T-virus, secrets held by the tree will start to be revealed at the uh, first signs of outbreak. Clearwater MD is such a good something fucking awful is going to happen in this town name. It's not clear anymore. Ah, uh, the little town of Clearwater. You are in my grasp. That's Albert Wesker, like, looking at the top window of a skyscraper and, like... <laughs> this skyscraper John is, is also doing a in clear movement. water. <laughs> this is the only skyscraper in that small town. <laughs> Where Where's MD? <laughs> it is, it, it's a state, is it? Yeah. It's a... <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't, I don't it's National not... Harbor MD? No, what, what oh, is oh, it? It is, it is, it's, yeah. it's, it's Maryland, so it uses the first and last letters. Mm-hmm. State of Maryland, yeah. Oh, okay. Neve, what do you want from this series? Um, I want absolutely none of the Resident Evil characters we know to show up in it. Because I don't want them to fuck them up. I, uh, maybe I, I, do, I, I, who cares? Wesker. Yeah, Come go on. on, yeah, give me Wesker, give me You'll, some uh, Nemesis, I don't know. I don't mind this being its own thing. Like, I don't mind this I, being I'd like set in the universe. I'd like to try a live-action Leon again. Oh, I just don't think anyone will ever pull it off. Like, I just don't think there's a Leon in I, the world. I think, I, think they, I think you could find someone. Because, like, they got Jill real good. And they, got, they did. And they got Wesker real good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got Wesker perfect. Oh, Wesker is fucking great. <laughs> People who so- don't like that movie are insane. People who don't like that movie don't like The Matrix. And I, You know, people who don't like that movie don't appreciate art. Yeah, it's true. I want breakdancing zombies. I, I, want I want it to be Resident Evil, which is a perfect blend of camp and fear. I want to be wildly entertained, wild a little scared. If you could, If you could pick one of the games and be like, this is the tone, which one? Five. <laughs> Interesting. Not four. Well, four and five, that tone kind of crosses over, but five brings it yeah. brings it more. I'd, I'd really like an episode where the character has to change the password on a key card to get to a better door. And they, that's the whole episode. They do stuff like that in movies and stuff sometimes, and it kind of sucks. Like, there's puzzles in the first Silent Hill movie, and it's <laughs> real bad. That's like in the Tomb Raider movie with Alicia Vikander, there is a puzzle at the end of it and there's no tension to it because it's just watching someone like putting in a green light in there yeah. and a red light in there and you're like, okay, I can see how that would work in a game, but I'm not actively doing this and figuring it out. She was so great. She was. Alicia Vikander was a great Tomb Raider and I can't wait for the second one. Um, I want in this Resident Evil thing, lasers, like laser slicing. That mm. has to happen to some degree. Yeah, I really, really want to see someone get chopped up into like little bits, and it makes yeah. that wet meat sound. Yeah, that. Um, I want the uh, zombie dogs, obviously, uh, Dobermans, and I want a extremely clean white room. All of a sudden, miles underground, like Umbrella Corp, down below. I want a like respectable British actor like Jason Isaacs 
like have like his regular version and then his heavy makeup version when the serum backfires on him. <laughs> <laughs> I would like some pra- uh, like practical makeup and stuff as well. Yeah. Like, just, you know, you know, like, like in a lot of these, there's always the character who's turning into a zombie. Oh yeah, they've been bitten and they're trying to hide it, yeah. kind of thing. So there's kind of two ways you can go about that, and one of them is like the mod, the, the modern Walking Dead day way, where it's like, oh, I'm just feeling real sick, and just when I go, you, you fucking do it, Rick. You want it to be you, Rick, and take care of little settle. You know, it's that shit. Mm-hmm. But in the '80s, there was another way of doing it, where the person progressively gets more evil. It's the slime ball character who doesn't tell them. But it's it, it can even be like a nice character, but he starts turning into an evil zombie and saying evil things. Oh, kind of like a Cujo. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you kids want some brain burgers? <laughs> that's, that's all I want. Because they don't do that in films anymore. And I used to love it so much. I'd really love if like the good guy the whole way through finally gets to meet the bad guy and they go face to face with the bad guy and they go... I was bitten an hour ago, and now I'm gonna fucking bite you. Oh, that'd, that'd be, be so good! That'd be such a good fuck you move. And the bad guy gets bitten, and he's like, "You." I just love the idea. There's a showdown, and biting is involved. <laughs> yeah. uh, you have to cover a lot of space to bite someone, so he'd have to tell him at the right moment. I think. I think. I think you should tell someone from across a room and, <laughs> and just let just the run. tension build. <laughs> okay. So I, th- I, think, I think what happens is it's like Solid Snake versus Liquid Snake, where they like disrobe and they're gonna do hand to hand combat, and he lets himself get grappled with like the arm around his like neck, and then mm. he takes a chomp, and he's like, I, 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 I've got the virus. I'm gonna turn any second now, but I got you, buddy. There's a movie called Tokyo Zombie about this very thing, and a guy masters a particular martial art that he uses to grapple with the zombies in a way that they can't bite him but then he gets convinced that he's bitten and so he spends like 10 years as a zombie and then someone's like you're not a zombie dude (laughs) it's a really weird movie you know the way a lot of people are like I'm sick of the zombie genre and like it's it's so overplayed and kind of thing I kind of like that you can do weird shit like that with it I don't think people do enough weird shit yeah did you ever watch the zombie movie I don't know if this is the right name but Fido and it was like that British or Scottish comedian playing a zombie that was kept by a family as a pet. No. It was very good, if I remember correctly. But I remember it was watching also that- uh, War- uh, War- Warm Bodies with the guy Tony from Skins is pretty good. Oh, yeah. The uh, romantic comedy. What was that um, zombie one where it's got, it's, it's about, a, I think, a woman out in the desert and there's one zombie, but it's coming after her. And it's the fucking desert. Uh, I know the one you're talking about. I can't remember the yeah, name of it. Yeah, I watched it, but... Yeah. Zombies. Get creative. Yeah, it was called Fido. <gasps> Fido. Excuse me. Guys, what say we answer some... Emails. Electronic mails are a thing. Electronic mails. What Brian. are they? What? Yeah? No, go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> What's wrong, Brian? Digital technology. The internet. A com- Cyber space. A computer in your hand. Mm-hmm. Um, just virtual community. Mini discs. Mini, yeah. Like, first there was stone, now there is technology. Okay. <laughs> Neve, I want you to imagine a caveman is teleported to modern times. Okay. And he's just pissed himself. And he's just pissed himself. And ha- I want you to describe to him how to send an email to this podcast. <laughs> okay, buddy. I know you're warm right now, but you're going to get cold. Uh, so you got to move quick. You need to use this magic box. I present to him a laptop. And actually, look, I'll fill this in for you. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's ask. Let's find a boss at gmail.com. And then I hand it to him and he smashes his fist on it. Yeah. Yeah. Like most of our emails. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Brian, you look... 
I mean to talk to you, but why do you have this weird disdain for people who send us emails? I love our emails. <laughs> I know, but you get so mad about email stuff, <laughs> and I don't understand I'm it. Like, why are you emailing us? <laughs> Because we ask them to. <laughs> we give them an address every episode. This is our fault. There's nothing in our email address that suggests that we want to ask. There's no word ask. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for emailing us. Uh, I'm just winding John up. <laughs> and, I mean, he is, but he legitimately gets annoyed about emails so often. I'm like, here we fucking go. Yeah, <laughs> Here's a fucking email. All right. Oh... Brian, why don't you take this first one from Katie. Katie, horror for people who are scared of horror. Uh, Katie says, uh, I have always been intrigued by the horror genre and the darker themes it explores. The media, uh, the media, uh, the, the media I've been able to stomach usually remain some of my favorites to date. However, in general, I find it really hard to get past gruesome imagery and jump scares because of my total wuss. Where should I start so that I can explore this genre more? Thanks in advance. Thanks in advance. Love the podcast and always look forward to hearing more. Oh, that's why we get. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being a spicy poo. I'm yeah, sorry. It's true. <laughs> it came out hard. All right, John. Yep. Oh God, guys, what's wrong, Neve? <sighs> Neve, the human body is a beautiful thing, <laughs> and every two hours it has to come out. Okay. So, what is our advice? I always found when things got too scary in horror, I would go, I wonder how they did this. And then I start thinking about, you know, who has to clean up the blood, <laughs> how the effect is done or stuff like that. And it kind of takes the horror out of it. Yeah. It keeps you watching it. A, fr- a friend gave me advice when I was young. If ever a horror film starts to freak you out, um, start thinking about how much the actors get paid. <laughs> and whatever it is about that, it does kind of just... Yeah, let it take the tension out. Yeah, it's definitely like riding a roller coaster. Where like one of the ways to get over riding a roller coaster is just to scream very loud. <laughs> Works for me. Really? Yeah. That's your tip, Brian. <laughs> scream. That's literally just being scared <laughs> on a roller yeah. coaster. Uh, embrace, <laughs> embrace the fear. Just have a, just let it out. Okay, Katie. The next time you're watching a horror film, make sure you bring friends. And the first moment you're terrified, <laughs> fucking scream the just house down. Just scream. <laughs> bring a pillow. Just hide behind the pillow. I, I do that sometimes. During the time we watched <laughs> Kill This with Walt, and we gave him a pillow in advance because we knew he'd get scared during the scary bits. Yeah, it worked great. It worked great. Um, I always find horror TV is maybe easier to stomach. Uh, the extra, uh, the Exorcist TV show is a very good TV show, which is horror related, but is not too horror mm. and has very shippable priests. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I would say maybe try horror comics um, because with a comic book, like you control the rate at which you go. And so like, you know, if you don't want to turn the next page, you don't gotta. I'm always going to recommend Junji Ito. I think he's great. Um, I would start off with the collection Shiver, which is in hardback. And that's just a really great cross-section of the kind of stuff he does. And if you like that, then move on to Gyo. Not Gyo, sorry. Uh, Uzumaki. Uzumaki. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And, like, in terms... Like, can you guys think of any, like, say, like, milder horror movies? One, it's, yeah. It, I yeah. find this difficult because... Um, People are afraid of such different things. Yeah, like some people can't do gore. Like people don't like gore. Then I, I am like, I know someone who really hates home invasion. So they're okay with gore, but they don't like someone being alone in a house and someone else coming into the house. You know, home invasion is actually one of the things that still, it still gets me a little bit. Like, yeah, I'm still a little sensitive to home invasion stuff. Then I know someone who all who doesn't like um ghosts and spe- specifically seeing like ghosty image like someone standing in a doorway and that that that's what will keep them up at night night is that idea of an yeah. image so it's like it's so specific um i really like comedy horrors i like like stuff like Shaun the dead and mm. idle hands where it's like a mix of the genres and so you're enjoying the movie and there's sprinkles of horror within but they're both done very well cabin in the woods fun movie oh, yeah i thought that movie was so shit i know you would it was like <laughs> when i when i thought of cabin in the woods there i was like i bet neve hates this oh, movie i hate that movie so much it's got the j word in it <laughs> joss <laughs> I, I really like that movie i thought it was fun but um 
Yeah, I, I would be kind of reluctant to recommend any horror video games, because I think horror video games can nearly be more frightening. I got real spooked by them. Yeah. What do you think, Neve? I think horror video games are easier, especially if you have a weapon, because you just get to shoot the thing that you're afraid of. <laughs> so that's why I like Resident Evil, because it's kind of like camp horror. I, I guess the later like, ones, yeah. 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 I think identify what specifically you're afraid of. Because you might not think you know what it is, but you definitely know. Like, what do you not like seeing? Is it the blood? Is it guts? Is it a ghost? Is it an alien? Like, what is yeah. it the thing you don't like? And then look for the stuff Yeah, I know someone who's specifically scared of alien shit. Yeah. Like, to the point that, like, if we're watching a movie and they don't know what's going on, if it's, if they're like, Okay, if this is an, if this if if it turns out this thing is an alien, turn it off because I don't want to watch it. Yeah. I I used to be really really scared of found footage horror movies until like get kind of desensitized to them. Yeah, you do. But like first time I saw Blair Witch was so fucking like like it was horrifying. Yeah. But now that thing is just like you're more interested in how it got made, and it's still an amazing film. It, yeah, it's really mm. good. For, but but now but now but now it's a great film for different reasons. Yeah. Um, I would say like you can totally raise your tolerance of horror. Like, um, yeah, you can. My girlfriend used to be very afraid of horror when we started going out, but now she's probably better at it than I am. Yeah, now I have a horror film date with her every now and then. Mm -hmm. We're going through all the Halloweens. <laughs> have you gone to Halloween H2O 20 years Not later? yet. We're nearly there. I'm so excited. Oh my God. That's, um, that's a film. Yeah, Katie, good luck with that. Okay. This next one is either from Jesus or Jesus. Probably sure. Jesus. Probably Jesus. And it's Texas Brother. And for those of you that are really paying attention to this podcast, you know that a couple of months back we got uh, <laughs> a message from, honestly, what sounded like one cowboy brother to another. And you it haven't yeed your last haul. Haven't yeed our, <laughs> yeed our, yeed yeed our last, last haul. <laughs> which I think to this date is still my favorite Patreon shout out message we've gotten. Um. So, this... <laughs> Hello, Bosscast. It's me, the Texan brother who got out of the hospital. I would like to share a poem to my brother who listens to these episodes a day before me. Here goes. <laughs> Winter shall come and go, as it always does. With time, a flowing river, pushing things yet unseen to come along. Never stopping at these things... What? Never stopping as these things want to do... Yet here we are, preparing to sit and watch some comfy camping. I know that romance is our mother tongue, but love is not our native language. I still want you to know this is as it is sung by our favourite show. You are the greatest family I could have, and though this is not the best timeline, I would not trade it. Also, I'm bad at rhymes. I'm sorry if that was meant to rhyme and I butchered it. But I just thought that was a great sentiment. That's a great That's poem. That's such a good poem. Yeah, I love it. Great energy. I hope you all have a greater day than the one before it. Man, Jesus wow. sounds like a fucking charmer. You mm -hmm. are waxing lyrically. That is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Real wordsmith. Yeah. Nee, why don't you take this next one <laughs> from Relentless, I think, or Relentless. Relentless. Relentless with four E's. Uh, being that guy have you ever been that person in a public place who everyone avoids and stares at if no what's a recent or particularly vivid one you can think back on I, I've, I've got two stories okay Hit I've us. got one where I'm the witness to a person and one where I was the person okay uh, when you go on holidays to Japan you really stick out and you're not meant to eat food on public transport but I really really like that melon pan and I really stood out eating my fucking melon pan on the... I, I did get a bunch of dirty looks. And I'm sorry, everyone, but I just... Really, Brian, you weren't sorry. No, it was amazing. <laughs> and, you know, I was... What is it? A back of gaijin? Like, I, like, I really fell into that category. But, like, it's really hard not to fuck up in Japan. So you just sort of have to, like, understand it's going to happen. And you just try and be polite for the most part and just you know fuck up very politely i don't think i fucked up at all which means i absolutely fucked up the entire oh, time oh yeah absolutely yeah. me of because 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 you're going in may yep just 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 accept that there's going to be some missteps i'm so afraid of this already <laughs> i'm so stressed about it's, it it's fine look look they are so lovely about the whole thing and they're like oh my look it's fine you have big clown feet it's crap i know even in spain i feel like a human wearing a human mascot suit 
Like I feel Whoa. so weirdly Whoa. like Wow I feel really weird and big. <laughs> You're gonna feel so much bigger in Japan. There are yeah. tiny people. Um, but yeah, um, I, I really felt out of place. Uh, like, uh, yeah, like for, for, for me, it's always on holidays I feel out of place just because, like, it's just not your daily routine and, like, your wallet isn't where it normally is. And, like, tiny things <laughs> like that throw you off. Honestly, <laughs> it, it's that stuff for me. It's like. Why is your wallet in a different place? Because I don't want it stolen. <laughs> okay. It's it's closer to my chest on okay. my person. Why is it more likely to get stolen somewhere else? Because tourists get pickpocketed. Uh, yeah, I mean, depending where. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta be vigilant. Get a wallet chain. <laughs> yeah, and you'll look rad. I wasn't allowed to get a wallet chain when I was fourteen, and ever since then I've been like, well, I can't get it. No, my dad will get mad at me. <laughs> did, <laughs> did you not have one in college? Yeah, did you not have a wallet chain? Did I? Maybe, I don't know. I think I, you'd remember if you did. You listen to enough Limp Biscuit to own a wallet yeah. chain. No, I wanted a wallet chain, but my dad was like, you're not fucking getting a wallet chain. But maybe I can do it now. I'll be like, check out my wallet chain. And yeah, now's the time. In <laughs> yeah. your early 30s. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get fuck you dad earrings. I'm going to get a fuck you dad chain. I love my dad. I don't know why I'm being so like antagonistic to the guy. Because he's, he's the man. He, my mom is the man. My dad <laughs> is just some soft lump who says yes. Um... Then, a couple years ago, I was walking away from the Lewis line uh, at Houston Station. That's a very busy stop for the Lewis line. Uh, I was walking away back home because I don't live near Houston Station. I don't want to say where I live. Um, But the Lewis was coming in and honking to get the attention of the nearby security because he was like, you know, and I was like, what the fuck's going on? And all of a sudden, the crowd started gathering. So I walked for a little bit, but I didn't stick around because I got genuinely scared. Um, but the carriage is pulled in and in one of the middle carriages I realized it was completely empty because everyone had dispersed except for a man standing wearing uh, a clean well, it's not clean a, a, a white t-shirt and I think it was either white shorts but they could have been like white boxer shorts and he had like pale long white hair kind of like when Mr. Burns was in the casino but there was blood like coming down his nostrils out of his mouth onto the shirt. Oh. And he looked like a zombie outbreak victim. Fuck. That's fucked up. And security got on and just took him away and he was so calm. What happened? And I didn't stick around because I was like, that's none of my business. Uh, I need to get out of here, please. I'm fine. It was so crazy. And afterwards, I checked on the news to see if there's anything about it. There wasn't. I'm sure, I'm sure he's safe. No, they're going to cover that shit up. Yeah, it was just, it was wild. Wow. And this was on like a Friday afternoon. What about you, Neve? Um, I remember I was walking down the steps of H&M. And as I was co- going down the steps, there was two girls going up the steps. And they both look at me and one of them goes, see, that's a lesbian. And I just, <laughs> I was just like. What? <laughs> and then they just kept walking. <laughs> how how did that feel? Uh, really alarming because it f- felt like they were having a discussion about what lesbians look like, and I just happened to walk in at the right moment as like figure A, and it felt weird. I was I was uh, taken aback, but also not the first time that's happened. Sure. Um, but yeah, anyone who stood out specifically to me. No, you see, I don't like seeing things, so I don't wear my glasses in public. So the That's whole good move. entire yeah, is. world is a comfortable blur. I don't know if anyone's looking at me. I don't know what the fuck's going on most of the time. You have to get really fucking close to me before I know what's happening. See, I love people watching so much, especially in like airports and train stations. See, and stuff. I, I kind of try and avoid those situations, but I think because I try and avoid them so hard, I give off an aura that draws them to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's it's your dark features. Yeah, I get weirdos come up to me all the time. Like one time I was really like, I don't want anyone to talk to me. I just want to get milk in this shop. And I remember just, I was wearing all black. I had my hood up. I was like, I just need to get milk. No one speak to me. And a little old lady <laughs> out of a whole shop full of people patters up to me and she's just like, dear, could you do up my jacket? My arm is broken and I can't get the zip. And I was just like, I am being my most intimidating. <laughs> But yes, I will help you. <laughs> and I zipped up her coat for her. 
but even in my attempt to be scary oh yeah uh there is this weird little child in a shop before and this is a person don't worry it's cute uh, but, oh, but it, children are so awful. <laughs> Did you ever meet a scary child? But <laughs> like Dublin scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was a very cute Little child. Bricks. She was going around putting lemons in everyone's baskets so everyone had to pay attention to her. And I went home with a lemon I did not want. But yeah. Little there lemon girl. <laughs> little lemon that girl. That little fucker. Okay, no. little little lemon girl should be the name of the episode. <laughs> And I think just Neve's nickname from now on. Um, so I, I've, I've, I've encountered a few weirdos. I might have told one or two of these stories before on the podcast, but I like telling them. Um, so the first was one day, this was many years ago, and Brian, I was walking home with your Rebecca. And oh, the next smell. thing, I just got hit with the strongest, most unpleasant smell of my fucking life. It was like being slammed against a physical wall. Like... I felt weakened for a moment. <laughs> my maximum HP went down. In not, I didn't take damage. My max HP went down. It's a different problem. And so I look ahead and I see this guy and he's in like a dirty jacket and jeans. And the jeans are riding very low on him. But how would I describe this? There's like a triangle of shit on, his, on the back of his jeans running down his leg. And it is caked and <laughs> it is so fucking awful to look at but do you know what really strikes me about this guy and i've thought about this for a long time because to this day he's clear i can see him clear as day the fucking confidence this man was walking with he didn't give a shit what was happening that was, if you were bothered by his state that's your problem, buddy. And he just sauntered on like it was absolutely fine. And then he just turned and he walked out of my life forever. But I'll never forget that man. Um, another time, this was in the last year, I was on the Lewis line going into town. And we were stopped at a station. The Lewis is like a tram. And across the road, there was another Lewis. And I saw these two women. And one of them was compliment. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but one was complimenting the other on her jacket and I looked away for what couldn't have been more than five seconds and when I looked back both women were one woman was like trying to escape the Lewis and the other was pulling her back in Texas Chainsaw Massacre style and then when they got back in they both grabbed onto each other and then raised their legs and started flailing their raised leg at each other and it was so fucking weird I love seeing public fights. It's wild. Yeah, it's it's fun, all right. And um, there was one time that I was the weirdo, and I, I think I have told a story before. But it was when I was in a FITAC college, and that's like a kind of co- that's like a course in between, like high school and college. So it was like around that age, and it was in. It was like half the building was like for FITAC courses and half the building was just like I think it was a technical school and it was a kind of rough enough technical school like these children they were not like they didn't have a lot of airs and graces about them but um, one morning it was just pissing rain and I only had one pair of shoes and I didn't want my shoes to get wet and so I put plastic bags on my feet and I cycled to Dundrum And I got out and then like all the children were like inside in this kind of little hall area and I had to climb this like flight of stairs to get to my class. And so I'm like walking up the stairs and I realize I haven't taken the plastic bags off my feet, which were kind of tied around my feet. And every step I take, the crowd of children gets like quiet. I say children, these are like teenagers. They get quieter and quieter until I get to the top of the stairs and I turn around and it's just 200 beady eyed little fucking faces staring right at me. And I just look at them and it's like quiet for like five seconds and I just I just shout I didn't want my feet to get wet. And then they all erupted in laughter and started making fun of me. And then I just walked to class and I sat down. And then Michelle was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah. That's my story. Just just a, a normal John time. You know, it's not even one of the weirder times, but yeah. Brian. Or yeah. No, I'll ta- or, yeah, Brian, why don't you take this? Um, so this is from Tim from Texas. Tim from... T- oh, Texas Tim. We got some Texas boys going on. Okay. 
Uh, Creative Freeze. Hello, John, Brian, and Neve. I just had a question for y'all about creating art. I have always wanted to be a writer, but I find that almost any time I sit down to write, I freeze. I'm just afraid that I'll never turn out well, so my mind goes blank. So, question is this. Do y'all ever experience this with your creativity? And if so, how do you overcome it? Finally, I'll share a poem. Uh, so maybe I'll get to the poem after. Yeah, let's end on the poem. I like that you wrote y'all. Yeah, that's great. Love it. Yep. Excellent. What would you guys say to this? Uh, smoke some weed. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, genuinely uh, go to your notes on your phone and write a sentence. Like if you, you have a cool sentence in your head or something like that that's happening in your head, um, write it down, write a few things down here and there and just like compile them into a docket, even if they're not like they're kind of disparate. Um, just because you'll have written something and then you can use those as blocks. Um, that's kind of sometimes what I do. It's like I open notes and I write something that I want to kind of expand on later or I want to kind of look up or kind of yeah. uh, draw. The way I feel comfortable with ideas, and it's kind of my thinking in general, is I like to start in the middle and work my way left and right of it. Like it's very, very difficult to go, okay, page one chapter one yeah let's opening start opening line yeah. yeah opening line like that is such a like cliched fear like because mm-hmm. cause you always see it in the movies you always see it in these like like struggling writer page, movies yeah. yeah and like you do not start on the first thing ever you start in the middle and whittle your way out of it it's even with essay writing like start in the middle and write your introduction and conclusion after kind of thing or start with your conclusion and then write everything after yeah because like it, it, it is like sculpting something out of marble like you, you you find something in the middle inside and you you work out the details and the details are always at the beginning and end but like the bulk of like what you're passionate about is the middle part of any idea whether that's writing or drawing or whatever like it like you, you always start and spread out mm. in any direction you feel it, it flows to that's what I mean with like taking the kind of notes and just kind of writing like a sentence here and there that you sound that sounds cool to you and then you can expand back or forth. Yeah. I think um the way I like to think of it is like if you ever watch someone draw, you know, most of the time like when someone's drawing, they're going to do a rough sketch. And the rough sketch like a lot of the time it'll be like, you know, shapes and just trying to figure it out and like what are the bones of this drawing? Like what am I trying to work from? And I think sometimes, like, with people who haven't, like, written a lot, they they kind of don't realize that that's a phase of writing as well. The first time I ever do any script, I sit down and I do, like, just a complete rough draft. And I'll do, like, 5,000 words all in one go, and it's shit. But it's fine, because it's scaffolding. That's all it is. Just, like, a rough sketch. All you're doing is, like, preparing the shapes that you're going to build on. So... What I'd say is, like, any rough draft you do is going to be infinitely more valuable and useful than a blank page. So all you have to do is worry about getting just anything out. It doesn't matter if it's good. It doesn't matter if it makes sense. It doesn't matter if it's something people are going to read. Just get anything out because you can work from there. And if anything that's going to get you out of that blank page is going to be better, even if you think it's total garbage. But just go easy on yourself and like don't beat yourself up over it writing's a process you know it's more about rewriting than it is writing so don't worry about it too much just get something down and at least from there you'll have a better problem than nothing yeah it's like i think the best advice i ever got for um background design and animation and stuff i remember being really agonizing over particular background in randy cunningham because it was like a weird down shot with a weird angle of a couch and i just could not draw this couch i was like I don't understand the perspective that's happening here at all. And the best advice I got was just like, just draw it bad. And then once you see it bad and once it's there, you can fix it because you have something to fix. Yeah, I think that is some of the best like artistic advice possible. Mm-hmm. Like no matter what, it doesn't matter if you're like, yeah, like it, sculpting it, shit, if, if you're writing a poem, if you're designing a house, it's all, as long as you, it's so much easier to fix something than invent something from nothing. Yeah, it's, it's just a placeholder until you're happy with it yeah and when you know it's a placeholder that doesn't mean you that that lets you not kick the shit out of yourself for it yeah. not being great it gives you the freedom to just let your hand do the job and then afterwards your brain can be like okay yeah like a lot of the times when i get proud of something i make it's because like i build on it incrementally as opposed to just have this massive burst of inspiration 
and like I like to when I'm doing a video there's always a point towards the end of a video where I'm like okay what's the worst part of this video and then I hone in on that and I'm like okay let's make this one of the best parts and I just do that to each successive part until the video starts to feel whole and mm. it's the same you create a problem and solve it yeah Brian why don't you why don't you take us through this poem okay okay Texas Tim well it's not well it's it's Tim from Texas but I like Texas Tim as well um here we go it is lovely a thing indeed. I fill the cup full to sate my greed. The color so warm and inviting, a light scent of lemon is biting. I take a drink and taste the sweet, but notice a slightly bitter streak. I enjoy this drink for a little while, but to enjoy too long is not my style. Soon I will move on, my dear, for I have found it all in my absence here. And that was by the Little Lemon Girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was Tim. It was from Texas Tim. Texas Tim. Texas Tim. Uh, Texas Tim and then uh, Jesus from Texas. Are you guys brothers? Are you, are you Texas brothers? <laughs> Seems like everyone Everyone Texas... from Texas is related. Yeah. I don't think it's a very big place. So yeah. Makes... Yeah, yeah. If, if you guys aren't, you should hang out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You guys from Texas, you like you like doing Texas. Just, Texas a, just stuff. a little a little posse of cowboys who were yeah. into this video Irish video game podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, let's move on into our Patreon shoutouts. Neve. Well, first off, me and Brian have got a special shout out of our own. Yes, we do. Whoops. Uh, this is to Sam the Immortal. Sam hooked me up with the piss controller from Death Stranding. I had spoken before on this podcast about my desire to own the terrible, terrible curse controller. And now I do, and I love it very much. And so continues my extreme love-hate relationship with Death Stranding. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and thank you specifically to Sam as well for the Jibin Yang plush. I made a, a a happy scream laugh when I when I saw it. He sure he did. did. Yeah, he did. I asked, "Was there anything for me?" And Neve reached into the bag and she was like, "Oh, oh!" And then she pulled out her hand and she was flipping me off. So thanks for that, Sam. That was uh, that was what it was. The queens get presents. Yeah. Patreon shoutouts. All right, the best website in the world exists. It's called patreon.com forward slash lfab brian you told me that was the web best website in the world and i was like oh come on dude and then now holy <laughs> shit <laughs> it's like you can just contribute whatever you want john's like whoa, whoa! <laughs> and all i've done is entered my name yeah all this like information is just blasting yeah, yeah oh my god it was crazy um, probably the best evening of my entire life we announced our new goal of playing shenmue 2 yeah guys we can do it um Made that funny picture. Everyone seems to like that picture. Yeah, that picture got around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your continued support. Maybe... Yeah, and thanks for everyone who contributed recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A big surge. Thank big, you so much, everyone. Big surge. And, uh, yeah, please help me fulfill my dream and playing the most important game in the world. And, look, I acknowledge, in hindsight, Shenmue 1, serious problems with that game. Shenmue 2, the best game. We'll see. Neve, what's your favorite game? Nier Automata? Yeah. Dog shit compared to Shenmue 2. <laughs> Brian, how about you? What do you like? Um, I like uh, Kirby Superstar. Fucking garbage compared to Shenmue 2. It's really not. Well, you you see, you, you haven't played it, so you can't say, but I can. Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> Patreon.com forward slash LFAB. Have your mind fucking blown by the shit on this page. It's incredible. We have a Discord. Everyone is super cool on it. They have a shout out section. Type what you want. We'll say it. Here we go. John, you want to take the first one? Um, Eve, why don't you take this first one? Um. I think you need to take this first one. Yeah. No, I think we can just kind of take them in whatever. Okay, well, how about I say it, and then we'll kind of, like, move it on. Uh, Game Girl says, I would like if John would say this phrase. John, could you say the phrase? No, I... I who the fuck is Riska? Well, say it. 
No, I don't John, see that. Say it. It's not. John, say it. They paid money, didn't they? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me just fucking look up this person. No, no, John, don't, 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 don't Google it. <laughs> don't Google it. Just it's say it. It's too late. I'm googling it. Uh, what is it? Some fucking Homestuck shit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't care. I have nothing against Homestuck. You like Undertale. It's not the same. It's so I, same. It's not this. Fuck you. Uh, Near Tom, it's a titty game. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. That's why I like it. Yeah, me too. It's like the only thing I like about it. It's just like Hot Maid. It's cool. And Neve's like, there's so much depth here. And it's like, sure, Neve. <laughs> that's actually very funny that it coincides with a best of that's coming out. Like, <laughs> we're at the same time as this. Oh, Neve, why don't you take this next one? You did Say oh, it. Damn it. I stand brisky. I stand brisky. Okay, fucking I stand brisky. There, fine, whatever. Three times you got it. Thank you. you no brisk will appear. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this one is from. No, this is my one. Uh, this is from Impala Lama, and it is a comic book panel. And say, Impala Lama says, I need John and Brian to say this image word for word. Thanks. So this is a panel featuring He-Man and a character called Fisto. <laughs> so who do you want to be in this situation? Because I'd like to be Fisto. Um, sure, I can be He-Man. Um, I wish I wish there was... Is Can we tweet out this image? Yeah, we'll put this image out on Twitter if people want to look at the image and read along. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it'll be our last loot drop. It'll be like a cursed loot drop at the bottom. Okay, Brian, let's take like five seconds and really get in scene, okay? Okay. Fisto my friend are you alright here let me help you to your feet I fisted hard He-Man but I could not fist them all (laughs) that's some good stuff Neve (laughs) are you you okay Neve yeah yeah that was just uh, very good Um, this is from Drayden and it says, insert funny joke here. Nice. Do I have to? Yeah, we're waiting. Neil's, Neil's got to do a funny joke, everyone. Like a real, a real, a real funny one. A real a tummy, tummy tickler. <laughs> uh, where do bees go when they need a ride? The buzz stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good Brian uh, I want you to start posting your applications so, so get a new, <laughs> new third host on the podcast a, 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 a woman hey, so. hey John what do you call a snail on a boat what a snailer <laughs> <laughs> go on John your turn John's very funny everyone yeah. <laughs> 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 no I'm not Oh, um, loot drop. We're at the end. We're gonna give you some goodies. Just take them and leave. <laughs> we just—it's not a hostage situation. <laughs> we just want to crawl back in under our bed <laughs> that we all live underneath. We all we all sleep under a bed. Um, so I am going to loot drop Jenny Nicholson's new Star Wars video. What you need? What do you got? <laughs> uh, Berserk is beautiful from Mika Sakas. Even her fucking anime. I okay. Just, okay no, this look, video uh, uh, really spoke to me in a lot of ways, specifically <laughs> about Berserk. Yeah, um, Mika Sakas. This, oh, this is my loot drop. He's trying to steal it. Um, <laughs> yeah, Mika yeah, Sakas is he, he makes really fun little videos, and this is a really really cool one about Berserk. And I think there's a lot you could say about Berserk, and I think he put it very succinctly here in a real, like, little trademark style. And I just, I think this guy's work is really great. I love his channel. Neve. Uh, mine is Jenny Nicholson. She has a new Star Wars video out. She is reading the screenplay for Star Wars Episode Nine: Duel of the Fates. This is the Colin Tre- Trevorrow. Tre- yeah. Trevorrow. The, the, guy, the guy who made Jurassic World. Um, it reads exactly like the guy who made Jurassic World. It's like, ugh, it's... He, he turns Poe into Chris Pratt's character. It's terrible. Uh, so <laughs> some of it is better than Rise of the Skywalker. Wait, what is Chris Pratt's character from Jurassic World? 
just a guy who negs another woman <laughs> into a relationship with him while being chased by dinosaurs. And he's friends with dinosaurs because he's amazing. Yeah, he's just a he's just a cheeky guy, a bit of a rogue. You can't help but love him, despite him being absolutely shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good trailer voice. Yeah, it's like he's a he's an author insert author insert character completely. Yep. Anyway, this is a very good video, uh, and Jenny does a great job. Her Star Wars videos are always fantastic. They are indeed. Uh, then I have Technology Connections on YouTube. This is a channel I've gotten into recently and it's very good. It's kind of like started off as a tech review channel, but now it's like, here is old tech. This is how it works. Isn't that interesting? Which is a great concept. So this is on the color brown. Um, did you did you guys watch this video? No. The color brown is a weird color where it exists in the world, but the spectrum of light tricks us. And when it is displayed digitally, it is even more of a trick. And it's a very interesting video on the color brown. Cool. Honestly, check yeah, it out. You, you're going to be like, you know what? That color brown's all right. Color theory is cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting. Oh, I want to go to bed. What do you call a cow with two legs? What? Lean beef. <laughs> John, come on, give us one joke. Um, okay, banter for a moment and I'll think of something. <laughs> um, Neil. Oh, how do we banter? Neil, what's your favorite thing about being the queen? Um, that I'm so beautiful. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about being queen? I get free chicken nuggets wherever I go. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, and sometimes I look at John and I go, <laughs> glad <laughs> no. that's not me. <laughs> not a queen Yeah, over there. And can't tell a joke. <laughs> <laughs> just blanking. Just, oh yeah, blank it again, huh? Yep. Yeah. You could do a knock knock one. No, I feel like I'm above that. <laughs> I don't think you are. <laughs> <laughs> above knock knock jokes. My style of comedy, it's very, it's sophisticated in a way I think that goes over your both your guys' heads a lot of the time. Probably. Yeah. Like I think for us it's kind of like a delayed laugh where we're kind of like huh, that was that was a funny thing that happened to John. <laughs> you can just combine two words that sound funny together. No, <laughs> no, no, and we're not going anywhere. <laughs> This is how the episode ends. This is yeah. the. I'm so sorry, everyone. It's just there's nothing there. Just nothing there. So I'm gonna write in the episode description. Stick around till the end for John's. <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. This is so awful. And there's jokes I like. <laughs> I I oh I could I could tell one joke, but it's like 15 minutes long. No, I want to go to bed. Yeah, no joke. I have to pee and go to bed at the same time. Okay, I well, there, I have the perfect joke, but unfortunately, little babies gotta go piss themselves in their little beds. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, good. everyone. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. I got one, I got one, okay, okay, I got one, I got one, I got one. It's really good. Okay. What do you call a can opener that doesn't work? A can't opener! Goodbye, everybody. Bye!